your life now ma'am a uh, very good evening to one and all of you for a yet another very interesting arc uh, webinar and this time it's uh, pg update series is on uvia and it's going to be a very interesting uh, kind of learning is what has been named as debates with a twist and uh, very interesting topics have been put together with great uh, attention to detail and with the best of expert panel and a great set of speakers we can truly look forward to a next two and a half three hours having us learning a lot so we have the best of expert panel and let me start off by introducing one and all of them we have with us dr avinash patanjay who is the director academy for i care education and also a consultant in vitreo retina and uvia services we are truly enlightened to have him with us we are lucky to have with us dr jyotir may biswas who again heads the uvitis and uh, ocular pathology from shankar netralaya chennai and uh, another expert true expert and he is going to de definitely open up all the crevices of uh, knowledge which we need to harness we are truly lucky to have with us dr ratnam shiv kumar who is again the chief of uvia services and also principal of the post graduate institute of ophthalmology of the arvind eye care systems and uh, we look forward to learning a lot from her uh, joining us shortly would be dr vishali gupta who is again a senior consultant with your retina and uvia services from uh, pgi chandigarh and i'm sure she is going to have hordes of information to sh share with us we are very lucky to have with us dr sangwan who who is a specialist in multiple things like cornea stem cells uvia cataract surgery and is one of those most experienced uh, doctors in the team of uh, shroff charity eye hospital and we are really enlightened to have you with us sir moderating with me is uh, dr shri srinivas joshi a young dynamic ophthalmologist and um, he is a, a member arc south and is one of the leading lights of mm joshi group of eye hospitals uh, a very versatile surgeon and i'm sure he is the future of one of the future of the young ophthalmologists of our country so to, without wasting time let's go on to the most interesting eight set of debates which we have in front of us and the first debate is going to be do all patients with intermediate uveitis need treatment and we have talking for it dr mudit tyagi who heads the uveitis and ocular immunology services from lv prasad hyderabad and uh, arguing against it is going to be dr reema bansal who's the additional professor again uvia and vitreo retina services from pgi chandigarh and let's hear these dynamic uh, speakers tell us something more about what we know need to know about treating an intermediate uveitis patients on to you dr mudit yeah so i'm audible i believe yeah yes just one second i'll just so are my slides also visible yes all right so first of all let me thank the aius scientific committee and all the conveners of this panel for giving me a chance to speak on this topic now what i am talking about is do we treat all patients of intermediate uveitis at who are the ones who definitely do need treatment now the question that we have is to treat or not to treat now before we go on to the question regarding the treatment of these patients what we need to understand is that intermediate uveitis is that subset of uveitis where the major site of inflammation the nidus the point which is inciting everything that lies in the vitreous so vitreous is a major site of inflammation and if you look at it while western literature says around 1.4 to 2.2% 22% of all of uveitis is intermediate uveitis what we see in india ranges from something around 10% to 18% it affects all age groups usually in the third to fourth decade however in pediatric subgroup it is around 10 to 12% there is no gender predilection and nearly 70 to 80% of these patients may even though if it's asymmetric have a bilateral onset of disease now what we do also see in intermediate uveitis apart from vitreitis or vitreous involvement sometimes is a cystoid macular edema peripheral snowball exudates snow banking inferiorly and sometimes this snow banking become extremely confluent and you may also sometimes see peripheral neovascularization now traditionally what has been told to us is that what are the indications for treatment 
So a visual equity less than 2040, Sistard macular edema, vitreous haze and vasculitis have till now been the conventional indications for treatment in a lot of these patients. But occasionally you may have patients who are falling outside the spectrum of these. And let me show you one example. So this was one patient who came to us with a decrease in vision in the left eye and the OCT showed us the presence of cystoid macular edema. But though the vision was 2032, this patient ultimately turned out to be positive for syphilis and thus ended up with treatment for syphilis. So the point is that apart from the vitreous manifestations, a lot of times intermediate uveitis can have underlying systemic diseases like syphilis or tuberculosis in infectious causes. You may have systemic associations like multiple sclerosis, sarcoidosis, and these diseases in itself do need a treatment. So saying that you are only supposed to treat a patient who falls into that particular subset is taking a too simple approach towards how things may be in uveitis. So if a patient has got an underlying systemic disease, even these patients do end up needing treatment. And though my opponent in this disease debate over here will probably present some other views, but the fact is that one of the largest studies which actually came from their parent institute also showed that a lot of these etiologies are secondary to TB or multiple sclerosis and timely management. And this is the important word, timely management of these patients leads to an improvement and stabilization of vision in 93% of eyes, with 70% achieving a final visual equity of 2040 or better. So while we do come back to the point of 2040, the important word over here is timely management. And why that becomes important is because what happens if you do not treat these patients in time? If you don't treat these patients in time, because of the chronicity of the disease, you end up with this plethora of complications. Glaucoma is known to complicate 7 to 11% of these cases. You have a high incidence of cataract in these patients. Cystoid macular edema, something which we have already discussed. ERM, vasculitis, peripheral neovascularization, retinal detachments, which may be exudative, fractional, or even sometimes regmatogenous. And also sometimes if this peripheral snow banking leads to secondary membrane formation, then even an intractable hypotony. So how do you avoid these complications? You avoid them by treating them in time. Apart from that, what we have to realize is that even though the posterior pole examination may seem to be cursory, but frequency of vasculitis is variable, ranging from 17 to 90% in multiple studies. You may have neovascularization because of ischemia, which is happening. That may lead to vitreous hemorrhage detachments and cyclitic membrane formation. And while you may see these peripheral areas of vasculitis and inflammation over here, a peripheral OCD angiography or even an FFA may reveal the presence of peripheral areas of non-perfusion and peripheral neovascularization. And again, these patients, even if the vision is good, may end up needing a treatment. Apart from that, optic disc edema also is seen in 70% of cases. When we do an ephrosian angiography, you may find disc leakage in a lot of these cases, which may otherwise end up having a good vision. But still, you need to treat those patients. So my concluding statement over here is who finally does need treatment? Patients who present to you with a decrease in visual equity, not just 2040, but even patients who may have a decrease from their earlier 2020 to now even 2032. Patients with underlying cystoid macular edema, underlying infective diseases, vasculitis and other complications which we have mentioned. So the important word in all diseases when we talk about it, not only in ophthalmology, but everywhere else when it comes to medicine, a stitch in time saves nine. So treat these patients in time and you may end up avoiding a lot of these complications. And with that, I rest my case. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Dr. Mudit. Let's hear from uh, Dr. Rima and then we could go on to the discussion. Is my screen visible? Yeah. Yes. So uh, thank you, Dr. Chitra and the entire team of AIOS for having me here to speak on uh, do all cases of intermediate uveitis need treatment and to speak against the topics. So thanks, Mudit, for your inputs. So um, 
When it comes to intermediate uveitis, it's not always very easy to label the case of uveitis as intermediate uveitis because of all the anatomical classifications. It is the anterior and the posterior uveitis which are most well-defined and hence most well-recognized in clinical practice. So intermediate uveitis does pose a challenge when it comes to diagnosis and treatment. And the problem is because we don't have standard guidelines for the treatment, we don't have an endpoint for treatment of intermediate uveitis. And there is no clear consensus on the threshold for treating versus not treating. So as Mudit has highlighted, the, the factors that we take into consideration are visual acuity, presence of vitreous cells and the other features of intermediate uveitis like snowballs or snow banking, presence of cells in the anterior chamber, cystoid macular edema and traction components. If these are severely affected, of course we treat, but when do we not treat? <clears throat> now let me show you an example of this woman in mid forties who presented to us uh, with bilateral uh, uh, complaint of bilateral floaters, blurred vision for almost three to four months. And you can see the vitreous haze, you can see vitreous membranes and significant vitritis to the point that right eye, you know, the vitreous opacities did look like snowballs. So when we did the fluorescein, we found some peripheral vascular leakage in the right eye and in the left eye, the disc was quite uh, leaky. So do we label this as intermediate uveitis? We were on the point of labeling this as bilateral intermediate uveitis. Of course, there was no cystoid macular edema, which was very evident on the uh, fluorescein. So we decided to have a look at her interior segment and the left eye showed IOL with some deposits on the IOL. And the right eye clinched with a diagnosis. You can see the copper nodules and uh, moth-eaten appearance of the iris. So this was actually a case of bilateral fuchs, which is not so common but has significant vitreous involvement. And you know you may get carried away by treating this patient as intermediate uveitis. Another patient who presented with blurred vision, 624, 636 vision in the right and left eye, six months. You can see the fundus is not really visible. You can only see the optic disc. These are the optos images, significant vitritis. We tried to do the OCT to look for CME. We couldn't, we got very hazy scans and the lens was very clear. There was no cataract. Similarly, in the left eye, we didn't get any scan. What do we do? We uh, assessed the interior segment and you can see the, the amount of the intensity of the vitreous membranes on the slit lamp examination in the right eye and the left eye. And then a closer look, a repeat look at the cornea revealed single KP in each eye. The LFM was almost normal, six and four in the right and left eye. So there was no practically, there was no inflammation in the interior segment except the KPs, but the vitreous was dense. So we, just, we got the uh, fluorescein done. Again, we didn't have any information, but the clue was this was a 75 year old male who presented to us. So we did a diagnostic vitrectomy straight away. We couldn't think of giving steroids. We didn't know actually what was going on. So we did a diagnostic vitrectomy in one eye and we found that this, uh, this was actually a case of primary vitro-retinal lymphoma, which was mimicking as intermediate uveitis and the old records that the uh, uh, old man was carrying showed bilateral intermediate uveitis having been exposed to steroids. MRI did reveal involvement of uh, the brain and this was post vitrectomy. You can see the media is absolutely clear. The retina is absolutely fine. No cystoid macular edema, similarly in the left eye. Now this was a young boy, 21 years old, referred to us. He was already on oral steroids and azathioprine for two years with a diagnosis of right eye intermediate uveitis. Surprisingly, his media was quite hazy with vitreous membranes. And we found that this patient was nothing but a case of fugues. And I've seen more and more patients with intermediate uveitis need to be screened first for ruling out some other etiology rather than ruling in uh, to, them, to be them as intermediate uveitis. So the question is, why do we make mistakes? Why do we err? Because the threshold for treating every case is very low. Every we want to see every case and we want to treat. We want to do best for the patient. But in that attempt, we sometimes make mistakes. And because of the misconception that all cases of intermediate uveitis or intermediate uveitis like uveitis need to be treated, and especially sitting in a reference center, it's important to first rule in or rule out intermediate uveitis because we are not going to have patients who present always at the stage of the first episode of intermediate uveitis where you have a lot of cells in the vitreous, you have frank cystoid macular edema, you have snowballs hanging out there. So you may have these patients in intermittent or in the late stage. So the decision is to be taken when to treat them. And of course, as certain entities which may mimic and appear like intermediate uveitis, 
If it's a classical presentation of intermediate uveitis, it depends entirely upon the stage of activity. And I'll just quickly take you through this reference. Uh, it was a study in Germany where 159 patients of intermediate uveitis were retrospectively analyzed. <clears throat> and surprisingly, of, out of all the treatment that those patients got, there was almost one third, 22.5% of the patients who required no treatment. So there was a significant... Hello? There was a significant subset of patients who did not require any treatment despite being intermediate uveitis. To summarize what we follow in our practice and what I would advise is, if you have very active inflammation, even if the patient is asymptomatic or minimally, minimally symptomatic, prefer to treat. The patient is symptomatic, but no inflammation or minimal inflammation. Minimal inflammation, that means the patient has had the active acute attack. It is a residual inflammation assess the cause of symptoms. If the symptoms are purely floaters, you can observe or just do a floaterectomy. If the vision, the symptom is decreased vision, we have to assess for the cataract because the patient has been exposed to steroids or any macular complications like an epiretinal membrane and go for vitrectomy. So these patients need to be assessed very carefully before we decide what case is to be treated. And I believe that there are a lot of patients of intermediate uveitis who would actually no need no treatment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rima. And uh, it was a, a great set of uh, talks. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Avinash. We'll start with him. Uh, now, since I'm still in a confusion that which asymptomatic cases uh, need to be treated because everything seems to be a little elusive here, but uh, would this hold good that we treat uh, asymptomatic cases in a pediatric age group or how do we observe that particular age group? Uh, I think Chitra, you nailed uh, it on the head about the pediatric case. But just before that, pun un unintended, Mudit, I'd like to congratulate you again and again on successful ophthalmic practice in a busy STD clinic. So, uh, but, uh, you know, coming back to the point, uh, Chitra, about uh, pediatric cases, yes, that certainly falls into a realm of uh, indication for treatment in these cases and the majority of them. So uh, having answered that question, so the three important points which we would like to consider why this, this debate is all about, because uh, we know that some of these which have no underlying etiology can spontaneously dissolve. And uh, there is also a thought process is we have to outweigh the risk and benefit of treatment with prolonged corticosteroids in few cases. And the third point is like what uh, uh, Rima had, uh, brought up or the persistence like in fugue uh, cyclitis where these patients tend to persist and there's no treatment required. So these are three important points for which we brought about this debate about the discussion. And Mudit had brought about uh, a different paradigm in terms of bringing in the complication, which is also an indication for treatment and an underlying etiology, which uh, should be looked at and should not be overlooked. Even if the patient presents with vitreitis, these patients have to be investigated and if found to be positive, has to be treated. And in this case, it happened to be syphilis. So those are important points, uh, I would say. And apart from the point, what you had mentioned, pediatric age group is something which uh, we cannot uh, have these uh, guidelines set. Uh, for observations. Dr. Srinivas, would you take the next question with Dr. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I just, uh, just for the sake of uh, PGs and the fellows who are participating here, so i just like to know how do you differentiate between the fresh and the old vitritis and the vitreous cell? And uh, my second question is, uh, although MS is not a common condition, but uh, what are the ophthalmological clinical clues to suspect uh, multiple sclerosis in a case of intermediate this question is JBC. to me. Yes, sir. JBC. Yeah. Actually, my examination starts uh, from the split lamp uh, examination itself. So I look very carefully in the anterior vitreous cells. And I could make, I can make out that uh, difference between that active or um, is inactive or old vitreous cells. Active vitreous cells are white, a uh, little larger, and um, there are clumps can be seen. And the pigmented cells are, this is the old uh, anterior vitreous cells. I don't treat uh, that cases. And uh, another important point is that in the, before I forget, I don't treat the visual acuity 
even a 65 vision i have treated the patients with uh, immunosuppressive or posterior subtonal injection the reason is that if i see vitreous cells that is my parameter for uh, treating the patients of uh, intermediate uveitis so another near point to which uh, dr uh, rima has told rightly that we should not miss the uh, vitreoretinal lymphoma the reason is that um, they can be a serious uh, life threatening this is a serious life threatening disease if a patient of uh, 50 or more than that if you see that uh, vitreous opacity without snow banking keep a possibility of vitreoretinal lymphoma if they are not responding you should go for a vitreous biopsy in such cases i have seen in 30 years 30 years age uh, patients also develop uh, vitre vitreoretinal lymphoma in that so you need to be very careful about that can i add a point yes doctor yeah actually in cases where we are not able to make a decision whether to go for treatment or not ffa helps us a lot ffa if you have vasculitis and the peripheral vascular non vascular non perfused areas that shows that definitely we have to treat So flu FFA has a very good say in intermediate illness. So I find it a little difficult to do FFA in children. I do an OCT so to get an idea about that uh, macula. I look in every, every intermediate uveitis patients carefully the fovea if the reflex is sharp or if there is any dull reflex if it is seen I just go for an OCT because the patient the way the patient loses the vision is a cystic macula edema or erm that's the way intermediate uveitis patients lose vision irreversible loss of vision thank you doctor i think we shall go on to our uh, next debate uh, this topic is does vitrectomy itself in intermediate uveitis have a therapeutic role and the two uh, speakers to talk for and against are one is doctor uh, soumya babasu who is the head of retina and vitreous and uveitis services from lg prasad hyderabad and dr sudarshan who is the associate consultant again in the uvhs department of shankar netralaya chennai so and the discussants uh, here are going to be dr sanwan and dr ratnam and uh, of course others other two could uh, chip in any time so on to you dr basu thank you Ch dr chitra i hope uh, i am audible to everyone and Hi. the slide is seen so uh, Here goes the topic: Does vitrectomy in intermediate uveitis have a therapeutic role? I think the first question that we need to ask is: uh, What is the actual question? Does vitrectomy in intermediate uveitis have a therapeutic role? Yes, but if you ask, is vitrectomy the therapy for intermediate uveitis? Definitely no. This. clarity has to be there before we start the debate now uh why do we say that it has a therapeutic role now several studies have shown multiple in anti inflammatory mechanisms of therapeutic vitrectomy for any uveitic entity including intermediate uveitis this includes the removal of the pro inflammatory immune cells as well as the secreted cytokines removal of the helper t cells this is very important because these are the cells that recruit other cells into the uh, inflammatory uh, milieu and then also removing the antigenic load that is driving the inflammation so all of these together definitely help in reducing the therapeutic burden of corticosteroids and immunosuppressive drugs non steroidal immunosuppressive drugs which uh, are required otherwise for the treatment of intermediate uveitis besides this we know very well that many a times after the inflammation has resolved it can uh, the vitreous opacities can still persist and uh, you know here an optical vitrectomy is of great use so uh, this is how uh, intermediate uveitis uh, therapeutic vitrectomy can help in intermediate uveitis now apart from the anti inflammatory role uh, vitrectomy also has uh, a role in managing the complications of uveitis this could be the ones that are at the vitreoretinal interface such as the erm or a cystoid macular edema macular hole 
or those that are caused by traction, such as vitreous hemorrhage, uh, traction detachment, or a rheumatogenous detachment. Besides this, when we are doing a pass lensectomy for a complicated cataract, especially in pediatric intermediate uveitis, or like I mentioned earlier, in the presence of persistent vitreous opacities, uh, pass planar vitrectomy has a role in the treatment of intermediate uveitis. Now, we are often concerned about you know, the safety of the surgery in, uh, in these patients. Now, with the advent of small gauge vitrectomy, and if we use sharp trocars, use relatively uh, low suction, and then uh, understanding the fact that most of these eyes actually have an uh, established posterior vitreous detachment, or they may just have a, a, a tug which is only attached to the disc. These are the cases where you know uh, it's very easy to do vitrectomy uh, without applying too much uh, suction on the areas of vitreoretinal adhesion. Finally, if at the end of the surgery, we do at least a partial air exchange and then suture the ports uh, as frequently as possible, the risks of post-operative hypotony also become very less. Now, uh, several complications have been attributed to therapeutic vitrectomy. The ones that are known are cataract and hypotony, but the ones that should be understood uh, is the post-operative uh, retinal detachment, which is probably the biggest concern while doing vitrectomy in an inflamed eye. Now, if we see that for MIBS in general, the rate of uh, post-operative RD is 1.57%, while in uveitis, it, it ranges from 2.38 to 2.8%. And remember, the numbers are much smaller here. So the rate overall doesn't seem to be very different from what it is for MIBS in general. Of course, the other uh, unexpected complications which we should be aware about are raised intraocular pressure and post-operative CME. Now, I'll end my uh, case with this review of literature. This is probably the largest series on uh, the analysis of remission of intermediate uveitis. This is from the site study data from the US, and this clearly shows that prior pars planar vitrectomy was one of the predictive factors for remission of intermediate uveitis. I think this should really seal the case. So to summarize uh, the anti-inflammatory mechanisms of uh, pars planar vitrectomy, which helps in also reducing the therapeutic burden of uh, corticosteroids and other drugs, its role in managing the complications, the safety of this procedure, and the literature support from uh, you know, different studies that have looked at vitrectomy for intermediate uveitis should establish the case that it does have a role in the management of intermediate uveitis, though it cannot be the only treatment in its management. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Basu. Shall we hear from Dr. Sudarshan? Need, he needs that yeah, stroke the I, I need to yeah. So thanks, Dr. Chitra. Like as they say, that spoke the vitreal retinal surgeon. So probably the cataract surgeon will talk. So does vitrectomy itself um, in uh, intermediate duetis? The question is um, I probably got the clarity a little later, uh, I thought, but then I rechecked the question. It was like, does vitrectomy itself in intermediate duetis have a therapeutic role? So the answer is like the answer is no. In any case, I don't like any vitrectomy in any patient because I'm a cataract surgeon. So I would like to have vitreous in its uh, cavity as such safe. So if you find any of this, you find a spillover anti-rivitis or vitreous cells or um, any of these, you would start thinking about intermediate duvetus. So where is the inflammation in intermediate duvetus? The inflammation is actually in the middle, in the pars planar region. Okay. So uh, somewhere in the middle, whenever I think of uh, middle things, I keep thinking about this Thracian group. Something like us, probably like we, UAT is uh, specialists, are neither anterior segment people nor posterior segment people, or we are both. I don't know, we'll have the debate for another day. But uh, remember this condition. It is an inflammation of the vitreous and pars plena, and we are thinking of treatment of a pars plena vitrectomy. And it's really scary. The last time I heard about this was uh, wound debridement. This looks like wound scratching. I heard something like that was a, as an intern for a carbuncle. Even then, I was told that. Uh, you treat and control the diabetes, that's the primary treatment. 
I was taught to treat intermediate uveitis like this. If you have vitreous cells and a patient doesn't complain too much, you can probably watch or give them some topicals. If there is a spillover anterior uveitis, treat them with topical steroids or NSAIDs. If you have vision drop along with uh, post-resecant manifestations or CME, then you image and uh, investigate. So based on that, you treat them with periocular or systemic steroids or immunomodulators. But definitely not vitrectomy. I'm thoroughly confused. We just had a uh, discussion with experts telling whether to treat or not intermediate uveitis. And we are talking about straight away vitrectomy in a therapeutic role. So, see, the initial description of vitrectomy was uh, by my teacher's teacher's teacher. I'm trying to gain brownie points from the panelist, Dr. JB. Uh, so, this was initially described by Charles Kippens. The modified Kaplan's approach came in later, uh, with, which said that the posterior subtenance injection was the first choice. Now, probably other periocular or local intravitreal injections, oral steroids, immunomodulators, or biologicals, and then finally uh, laser vitrectomy. I think somebody mistook this uh, four uh, ladder, four step ladder approach because vitrectomy was on top, doesn't mean vitrectomy is a treatment option. So, if this is what uh, people say is old or conventional teaching, then what does the current literature say? So, I went through the literature also and uh, found that uh, most of these uh, studies uh, remain uh, lack of application of standardized reporting outcomes and so you can't rely upon it. You need to take them with a pinch of salt. And uh, some of the studies show that pan uveitis has better outcomes than uh, intermediate uveitis. There was a large study of six children which uh, promoted uh, parfenovitrectomy in intermediate uveitis. And then I saw this TB uveitis study which showed that uh, adjunctive parfenovitrectomy a case control study had uh, facilitating faster resolution. Then I realized this is Basu et al. So then I just moved on to the next one. So we had this uh, randomized kind of pilot study many years back, which again uh, didn't conclude conclusively that uh, it is better. But they just said that you need to have a prospective randomized multi-centered clinical trial. This was years ago when I was a fellow or probably after that. So at least if it's pus in the body, they say the victim pus anywhere in the body, you need to drain. But this is not necessarily always even in the eye, if it is endophious. But remember, hypopain uveitis in bestials or HLA-B27, you treat them medically. And in, come on, in intermediate uveitis, it's not even pus. Remember, what causes intermediate uveitis? It is because of autoimmune diseases, infectious masquerades and others. We saw Rima and Hamudit uh, uh, talking about syphilis and lymphoma. So can we try to solve all these systemic issues? It's just a temporary clearing effect of the uh, debris. You, think you need to treat the cause. And um, Soumya actually gave me enough tips against vitrectomy also considering the risks of uh, early cataracts in young patients. I really got to know that glaucoma is one of the uh, major complications post vitrectomy surgery, not hypotony. Risk of infection is there and there is a big list of uh, things. Um, but I'm not sure how we identify the pro-inflammatory cytokines while you're doing vitrectomy and remove them one by one. So anyway, we really have a big, uh, very nicely written review article which says that uh, Ultimately, it is important to achieve an optimal control of inflammation for best results before planning vitrectomy. So it all says that risk-benefit ratio for vitrectomy is very high despite MIVS in an actively uveitic eye. See, remember that vitreitis or vitreous debris is not the main cause of vision loss. The predominant cause of vision losses in intermediate uveitis is cystoid macular edema. So vitrectomy clears actually the vitreous exudates. If at all it has a role, then probably there is a vitreomacular fraction in CME. So if you're still itching to do something in the eye, then probably you can think of giving subtenons, intravitreals or rosidex or flosin alone. So they say if a sink gets filled up, then it's important that you plug the hole and stop the flow. Like it's, there's no point just clearing the sink alone and that's not the way to go about it. We've always been taught from our uh, medical days that uh, if you have a pitting pedal edema, treat the cause, cardiac failure. You have a 25 gauge, 26 gauge or a 27 gauge needle or a technique, draining is not the treatment of choice. So the preferred treatment algorithm may be that intermediate uveitis, if vision is normal or minimal signs, probably you can watch. And if there is significant inflammation, if it's unilateral, local therapy probably. If it's bilateral and associated with systemic condition, then treat systemically. Surgery comes into play when vitreoretic complications or if there is cataract. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sudarshan and Dr. Basu. That was a, a lot of thoughts on that uh, interesting topic. Um, but... Um, my question is that if you're going to be doing, a uh, question is to Dr. Ratnam. If you're going to be doing a past lena vitrectomy and uh, it's all about a good base sh uh, sh uh, shaving, that does that mean 
that you would knock off a clear lens. That does that mean that you would do a pass plana vitrectomy uh, with an IUL surgery too? Dr. Ratnam? Yeah. So, Ratan, can you stop sharing? Yes. Uh, uh, can you kindly uh, uh, repeat your question because the phone was ringing. Yeah, phone was ringing. Sorry. Uh, no, I just wanted to ask that if you're going to do a, a pass plana vitrectomy, does it mean that even if there's a clear lens, you would remove the cataract? If it is a clear lens, no, I won't even touch. But if it is cataract, Probably we will do both, partially in a lensectomy as well as vitrectomy. And vitrectomy, as uh, rightly mentioned by both the speakers, when we have more problem in the vitreous, vitreous is opaque or uh, there is attraction or there is a hemorrhage. So, uh, and very chronic uh, intermediate uveitis, not clearing with uh, anything, you know, opaque vitreous. Uh, all these things we do vitrectomy. Uh, but uh, I want to ask Dr. Basu, with this vast experience, after vitrectomy, is there any case the all these inflammatory cells come again into the vitreous or not? Uh, come again into the posterior uh, segment because after all, they come from the blood vessels. If the uh, primary cause is not treated, uh, has he seen repeated vitreous inflammation even after vitrectomy? In that case, in which entity he has seen more? Because in lymphoma, even when we do a vitrectomy, after some time, lymphoma cells come back again. Yeah. So, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, yes, treatment of the primary cause is absolutely mandatory. So, this I didn't highlight uh, in, in my discussion, but suppose it is sarcoid or TB, which are the common causes of uh, intermediate uveitis, which can be picked up. In other... Uh, I mean, even your study, intermediate uveitis is probably the one where uh, the cause is least often found. But suppose we are able to pull out uh, a cause for the uh, inflammation, then, you know, treatment of the primary cause is essential. And suppose it's sarcoid, you definitely want to treat it with immunosuppressive agents apart from corticosteroids. So that is mandatory. So this can only have an adjunctive role. And I think both me and Sudarshan agree on, on that uh, part. Yeah, actually the, the term adjunctive, not an alternative was actually given, which I put in my slide was told by Basu. So that was like a collaborative slide actually. The last uh, I have a quick question to Virendra sir. Mm -hmm. sir uh, of course, I, I do believe with uh, so Basu sir that even I, I would prefer to do a vitrectomy and the, the MIVS, now the surgeries as what uh, Sudarshan sir said about the tears, the RDs and all. With the advent of the 25 and the 27 gauge, I think those are all have definitely minimized and come down. But my question is in case there is a recurrence. So, of course, the treatment of choice would be giving the uh, PST or what's the role of supracoroidal uh, kind of uh, steroid injections, especially in case of NIUs. And uh, also, uh, in case if you have any, uh, 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 you, you need to do a methotrexate or any biologicals where we consider 400 micrograms in 0.1 ml. And what would be your dosage in the vitrectomized eyes? How would it differ? Uh, see, um, the management, uh, what the way we should understand for uh, intermediate uveitis, or for that matter, any uveitis, is the treatment, uh, the surgical intervention, whether it's cataract surgery or whether we're doing vitrectomy, that's not a curative surgery. It's only an adjunct, which may help you in ma making the diagnosis or transiently improving the optical clarity. But with vitrectomy, there is another advantage that once you clear off the vitreous gel, then the, uh, the posterior, vitre posterior cavity is filled with the aqueous humor or the more uh, psych, uh, you know, uh, circulating fluid. So when the inflammation happens, the circulation of the, uh, the cells, the clearing of the cells is much faster as compared to the vitreous. So all other medication also which you will do, they will reach better and they will also get cleared from the eye in the posterior segment much faster. So I would think of uh, uh, doing vitrectomy in selected cases where there is a disease which is localized and it does not have any component and it, um, the treatment of uh, uveitis, then you have to follow the same principles where uh, if it is focal, localized, 
uh, use regional treatment. If it is associated systemic disease, think of systemic uh, anti-inflammatory agents. Recurrence uh, and all you will treat as, as as like any other uveitis. Suprachoidal steroids, yes, of course, um, you can use if it's localized. Uh, and if it's localized to only one eye, the doses that I'm not very familiar. And now the vitrectomy is also not only think of that you have a uh, very small gauge, you have endoscopic VR system. And uh, once you go in the vitreous, you have access to the cyclitic uh, ciliary body also. You can think of uh, visualizing your uh, uh, ciliary body if there are any membranes, especially if there is intermediate uveitis associated with hypotony, which happens uh, like JIA associated uh, uveitis. Thank you, sir. Avina, sir. Yeah, yeah, sure. You need to un understand that the intermediate uveitis is not a localized disease and uh, it comes from that uh, inside, even if it's idiopathic. So we need to look for that uh, uh, systemic treatment for that uh, cases and many of the times. If it is localized, you can give posterior subtenon or the intervitreal audiodex. But ultimately, you need to look long term, you need to give some kind of an oral treatment or need to a systemic treatment may be required. I've seen many patients uh, that they have been treated earlier has come back uh, with the inflammation. Another thing is that we want to tell you that the intervitreal methotrexate is also a good option for treating the intermediate uveitis, which can be of uh, use of 400 microgram you can give. So we have given few cases of inter intervitreal methotrexate. So that's what my question, sir. What will be your dosage in a vitrectomized eye? Because it's in a non vitrectomized eye where they have calculated it to be 400 microgram in 0.1 ml. So I have not given any vitrectomized eye. And uh, can I have one question? Yes, Sudarshan, sir, he wants to say. So, uh, yeah, Sudarshan, I, I just, proceed. Yeah, no, I just have a doubt with the uh, thing. You know, sir was telling about uh, like not a local disease. Uh, I mean, I was just uh, interested in uh, Basu. He was telling about pro-inflammatory cytokines being removed out of it. And then like, is that an option of targeted therapy for that? And uh, we have seen many patients where they always come as only one eye. It, uh, for a long time, it's always unilateral recurring in that eye. So does it mean that it's a local uh, disease? Uh, probably, probably. Mm -hmm. And uh, answering your question, I too uh, have a same similar question. Uh, people say that toxicilimab is uh, a very good for macular edema. Any of uh, the seniors have experience of using toxicilimab in uh, macular edema of intermediate UVHS? No, I have not used it. No, no, no. Probably, probably we have to try because uh, repeatedly no. uh, rheumatologist uh, Raman, uh, Ramanan says that it works wonderfully. So we have to see. Dr. Kalpana, you want to add? Um, I have few cases where we have used tocilizumab. Some of them it works, some of them it doesn't work. Uh, do you give systemic tocilizumab? Yeah, systemic tocilizumab because the what, subcutaneous what one is very expensive. Uh, how, much, how much uh, you use? Uh, the first case which we published in long back, uh, yeah. we gave for two years. And that time we used the stills dosage therapy, which was 10 milligrams, uh, 10 milligrams yeah, uh, per kg. Uh, mm. But I think now when I look, because that time we didn't have data, and now when I review the literature, especially the uh, trials which have been done, it is four to eight milligrams per month. I feel that's not enough uh, because the ones which we did with uh, 10 milligrams did much better. Uh, mm. They did very well. But the problem is we had neutropenia uh, mm. because of the tocilizumab, especially when we gave them for a long time. So initially we gave them, I think once in three weeks, two weeks, and then increased it to once in three weeks and then once a month. Um, they, if you stop it, it comes back. So you'll have to give them for at least about 18 months. Uh, at least the case which I have given is for 18 months. And uh, now I've been able to keep him only on azathioprine. So I've been seeing him for the last four years now. He's doing well, but he still has peripheral vascular leakage, but still that's okay as long as he doesn't have any CME. But uh, I have, I'll be showing in my talk where I've burned my fingers with tosils and also. So Malika, you want to add something very briefly before we go on to our Yeah, next? I just wanted to say that uh, there was a question about vitrectomized eyes and dose. Or, 
So I don't think it matters because there is no study which has shown that the dose matters. And in anti-VEGF injections, etc., also we do not alter the dose in vitrectomized eyes. So I think we can go ahead with the regular dose. But it gets absorbed soon. If there is no VTS, any medicine will get absorbed soon. Yeah, yeah the, madam, the that, parents, yeah, that's, that's true. The parents theory, might be a little faster as well. That is true theoretically, but again, that has not been shown actually in reality by any study. So we can, and even we don't see that that happening when we give anti-VEGFs post-vitrectomized for AMD or DME. We do not see that we are injecting more frequently because they are vitrectomized. So we have been using methotrexate in case of intraocular lymphoma, post vitreous biopsy in vitrectomized eyes, and they do well, and they tolerate well, and we don't reduce the dose. We shall go on to our, amidst all controversies, we go on to our next speaker, next topic, which is uh, what is the treatment for uveitis, no inflammation or is mild inflammation okay? And we have our speakers, I think they could share the screen. Dr. Padma Malini, who heads the Department of Uveitis and Ocular Immunology at Narayan Netralia, Bangalore. She's going to be talking for, and Dr. Kalpana Murthy, who again heads the UV and ocular inflammation at Prabha Eye Clinic would be talking against this issue. So let's uh, look forward to the next interesting set of debate. On to you, Dr. Padma Mani. Thank you, Dr. Chitra. At the outset, I'd like to thank ARC team for giving me an opportunity to speak for target therapy for uveitis. I'll be talking towards no inflammation. The next six minutes also, we'll be covering about what's target therapy with the available review of literature. Now, how are we going to assess the UVA activities with case examples with take home points? The improved understanding of the abnormal immune response in various forms of uveitis has resulted in targeted therapy. Could be atypical cell populations or cytokine expressions or cell cell interactions. Different patterns of cytokines have been expressed. We are using corticosteroids, antimicrobial agents, immunosuppressive therapy, and biologics are used as a target therapy to control the inflammation. However, the challenges remain if there is persistence of mild inflammation in the eye. You may take activities assessed by the presence of anterior chamber cells and flare, vitreous haze and cells, and retinal, corridor, and optic now manifestations with the help of multimodal imaging. For the benefit of postgraduates, we take anterior chamber into uh, cells into consideration and also the vitreous haze for posterior segment inflammation. Standardization of uveitis nomenclature, sun grading as scheme of skills. In this, we need to have zero cells to grade it as zero. The next, the vitreous ACE is the current standard for assessing posterior segment inflammation and is accepted as a valid surrogate endpoint for disease activity, where we expect the vitreous ACE to be zero to call this as no inflammation. We call the uveitis is inactive when there are no cells or grade zero cells. We want all the patients to reach remission, that is inactive disease, for more than three months after discontinuing all treatment of eye disease. We'll move on to the case examples. Here is a nine-year-old boy presented, treated as recurrent uveitis with topical steroids. Whenever they used to stop the prednisolone acetate, the child used to get the reference, uh, recurrence. At that point, patient was referred to us. On examination, in addition to the anterior segment inflammation, patient also had vitritis with vitreous ACE1+. Thurston angiography showed perivascular leak in this child. In addition to the topical medications, we started systemic steroids and also systemic immunosuppressive therapy with methotrexate. This continued for nearly almost two years and following which we could see the anatomical restorations and also there was no perivascular leak in this case. It's important that we have to have absolute control of inflammation in these cases. The next is quantitative Quantitatively, we can measure the amount of flare by using laser flareometry. Here is a case of a JIA who had a flare, but the flareometry showed 16.6 significant amount of flare suggesting active inflammation in this child. Here is a case of an ARN following COVID vaccination. Inflammation the patient has anterior segment inflammation and also the retinitis. The OCT shows full thickness retinal involvement following treatment with antiviral and systemic steroids. That is complete resolution of inflammation. The treatment we continued for about almost nearly 14 weeks in this case. Here is a case of a sympathetic ophthalmia where we have exudative detachment with the coronal bulge and systemic steroids help us to control the inflammation in this case and also the immunosuppressive therapy. 
OCT helped us to monitor the response to treatment in this case. Here is a case of a serpiginous like coronitis, but autofluorescence helps us to monitor the response to treatment. Here, hyperautofluorescence suggestive of an active inflammation. This is a healing serpiginous like coronitis. This is completely healed serpiginous like coronitis. Here is a case of a chronic VKH. During the review, visual acuity is 6 6. Patient has vitritis. The fundus is looking near normal fundus. The OCT is also normal. Do we watch or do we consider this as a mild inflammation? On certain biomicroscopy examination, we could see the recurrence of anterior uveitis. ICG shows multiple hypofluorescent dark darts suggestive of coronal granuloma. We have to treat this condition as a recurrence of pan uveitis with systemic medications than considering as mild uveitis. We'll, this, we'll see a case example. We talked about tocilizumab now. Bilateral occlusive retinal vasculitis in a 45-year male. When he presented, he just had vitritis with cystoid macular edema to some extent. This is the timeline of the chart. The patient first started with azathioprine, then MMR was added, then the rituximab was given. So following which the patient presented at this point of time. He started cyclosporine, patient did not respond. In view of lupus antibody, anticoagulant was added. Adalimuma, partial response was there. Finally, we switched over to injection tocilizumab, following which the patient responded well. It took nearly about two years to reach that point. Here is a OCT showing diffuse macular edema in this case. So cytokine-based assays are available for personalized treatment for various autoimmune uveitic entities in the literature. Here at NN, we started doing personalized treatment for uveitis, where we use the tears and estimate the inflammatory markers in the tears using fluorescence reader. And based on that, we customize the treatment. For this particular patient, when we see the interleukin-6 was elevated in the right eye, following tocilizumab treatment, this is within four weeks, we could see the resolution of the macular edema in this case, and the IL-6 level also have come down from the tears. The targeted therapy to control the inflammation of uveitis is the way forward. No inflammation should be our aim, and we should aim for complete remission. Mild inflammations can lead to chronic complications. However, conditions like Fuchs, what we discussed earlier, can have mild inflammation. I would like to conclude with this. The spark is like a mild inflammation. When we don't control the spark, it can lead on to full-blown fire. So it's important that we control the spark so that we don't lead with fire. The similar way, we need to control the mild inflammations. If we don't control it, we can land up with full-blown uveitic entities with complication. I would like to acknowledge our team members. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Padmamalini. Shall we hear from Dr. Kalpana before we go on to discussions? Dr. Kalpana? Yes, ma'am. One second. I think there's some issue. Can you just give me a minute? Uh, one second. Yeah. Um, can you see my slides? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Okay. No. Okay. Um, at the outset, I would like to thank um, AIOS ARC uh, for this invitation. And I will take my talk um, starting from the conclusion slide with uh, Dr. Padma so nicely showed. So uveitis is a challenge for clinicians. I'm sure everyone here today will agree with me because there are numerous possible etiologies, each requiring different treatment approaches. Every patient is unique. We don't know how that patient seated in front of you will react to the given treatment. And in addition to the adverse effects of the disease, you also have to deal with the adverse effects due to the drug itself used to treat the disease. So addressing uveitis requires a lot of trial and error. And uh, definitely I do agree, the goal, ultimate goal is to preserve vision and uh, for this, there should be no inflammation in the eye. However, uh, I wish the, things were so simple 
uh, as black and white, but in reality, it is not so. And, and many times in our practice, we have to um, you know, understand this and say mild inflammation is still okay. Now, I will be showing a few case examples which will highlight this aspect. So let me take the first case. This is a 10-year-old girl with uh, idiopathic uh, uh, pass planitis with only one eye involvement, labs non-contributory who had failed conventional immunomodulation. And when I saw her, she was already on adalimumab for two and a half years. Her best corrected visual acuity has always been 6-6. Now, when you see her fluorescent angiogram, she still has extensive retinal vascular leakage with adalimumab. So it was very tempting because just then I had published a paper with tocilizumab and I said, let's try tocilizumab in her. And uh, the rheumatologist also agreed and we started tocilizumab. Three months down the line, I thought she was doing well, but to my horror, seven months later, the vascular leakage was still the same. And uh, more than me, the parents were very disappointed because they had uh, spent a bomb for the tocilizumab. And eventually they convinced me to uh, get her rid of all biologics. And today she's on methotrexate and mycophenolate. And still her vision is 6'6 with no cystoid macular edema. Now to highlight another similar case, this is a uh, you know, Sri Lankan male who had come for, I think, a fourth or the fifth opinion. And uh, he was already on an MMF and cyclosporin. Again, pass planitis, bilateral with good vision. And when I look at his uh, FFA pictures from 2013 till 2017, all of them are similar. And he said it, everything is the same. So I will continue MMF and cyclosporin. And he refused adalimumab. So his vision is still 6'9". So this patient still has vascular leakages, but clinically his eyes, um, you know, uh, the fundus looks okay. And fluorescent angiogram and OCT has not worsened. Now look at the third case. This is a 72-year-old lady with rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, she was already on methotrexit 12.5. Uh, and she was referred by her rheumatologist for an ophthalmology consult. So when I saw her, she had a history, her records show that she had a history of scleral melt in the right eye, uh, which was uh, treated with buccal mucosal graft two years ago. And her left eye, she had this uh, peripheral uh, uh, corneal melt. And uh, uh, you know everything was negative for infection. And normally when we see a pattern like this, we are very aggressive. So my uh, uh, gut feeling was let's start her with IV methylpred with IV cyclophosphamide, although reluctantly we, we went ahead uh, with cyclophosphamide, especially considering the age. So she had three doses and I thought she was doing better. But eventually after three injections of cyclophosphamide, she came back to me with a hypopion. And uh, her vision also had dropped in that eye. And when we did a tap, it turned out to be a secondary infection. So she was put on systemic steroids. So at this point of time, we thought we'll withhold the cyclophosphamide and keep her on a very, very slow taper of oral steroids and increase the methotrexate. Eventually, she did well, and it took her some time, but uh, things started getting better. And from the eye point of view, she started doing very well. However, she developed cough. And uh, when I did her CT, she had multiple lung nodules. And this was something like a MET. And uh, when we did a PET CT, I was horrified to see that she had a breast carcinoma with uh, metastasis in the lung. And probably the cyclophosphamide and all these immunomodulators with uh, thing could have hastened the progression. Now, uh, unfortunately, because of the steroids which she was on, uh, she developed her pressures, blood pressures went high and she developed a stroke as well. Unfortunately, the only good eye which was there in the right eye, which had a 618 vision, now had a counting fingers close to face because the nerve was involved. So uh, sometimes you, uh, it is important to take into account the age, especially when we are uh, treating such, um, uh, you know, treating aggressively with these medications. My case four is a patient with um, Wegener's granulomatosis with refractory scleritis and orbital pseudotumor. Uh, unfortunately, he had reached the maximum cumulative dose of cyclophosphamide, and hence we could not give cyclophosphamide. We were unable to reduce the oral steroids to less than 20 milligrams per day. And as per his rheumatologist, the systemic disease was stable, but it was only the eye which was involved. So at this point of time, we weighing the pros and cons, we decided to go ahead and try rituximab. Unlucky for us, he developed worsening of inflammation and this was one of the early cases of rituximab with worsening of inflammation. 
And uh, he developed again uh, fluid in the posterior uh, subtelin space and scleritis. And eventually he had to receive IVMP and very slow taper of oral steroids. So eventually we have been able to get him down to 5 mg of steroids, but I know the disease is still there because he continues to have choroidal thickening and he gets vague inflammations now and then. Though this is not the actual protocol, we kind of stagger the rituximab infusions and uh, we give it now with a little more higher pre-med of solumedrol with the rituximab to prevent worsening of inflammations. So we know that the disease is still mild, I mean, it is still present, but right now we have been able to balance both sides. And unfortunately, we do not live in a utopian society and definitely management of uveitis is an economic burden to these patients. And the newer drugs now come with a huge price. And these are not covered by insurance or any of the government schemes so far. I will just show you a last example. This is a five-year-old girl with oligoarticular GIA. And uh, she was on oral steroids and injection methotrexate for the last two years, but continued to develop inflammations in the eye. Now, this kid could not afford adlumab, though this would have been the best choice for her. And so we had to just add something else which would at least reduce the amount of inflammation much better than what we were seeing then. So we added mycophenolate along with this. And uh, though the inflammation did come down, definitely it was not no inflammation. And she also started developing recurrent joint swellings as well. So the disease was still active. Uh, fortunately for her and us, um, the uh, tofacitinib had lost their patent and Cipla was marketing it at a very low price. And we decided to try that in her. So though it was not as great as what we would see with Adlumab, but definitely the inflammation is much better. And uh, this is one of, um, uh, one of the perks which we can uh, see when we use biologics. But again, uh, cost is a huge concern. So to conclude, ideally, we would be, it would be best if there is no inflammation. But in reality, there are multiple factors which govern the management, which includes the etiology, associated systemic diseases, adverse effects of the drugs, and most importantly, the cost. So the responsibility definitely lies in us to balance between the risk and the benefits. And in this aspect, I would still feel mild inflammation is still OK. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kalpana. I think uh, uveitis, uh, in intermediate uveitis is a, a situation which keeps challenging us. And I'm going to take a question with Dr. Agnash. And I seem to be harping on the pediatric age group. Uh, but however, uh, I wanted to know that in this particular age group, at least if the inflammation is mild, would we let go? Or uh, we would be as aggressive as we would be with the adults, even with mild inflammation? Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amuthi. Your, your question is very relevant. Uh, so, pediatric age group is a different ball game and subset altogether where uh, though the primary goal elicited by both the speakers have been uh, uh, very clear. So, but pediatric age group is one such where sometimes the conventional treatment may not work and going behind to control the inflammation as much as possible. The ideal scenario is envisioned more in pediatric than in adults because they are able to take uh, anti-inflammatory therapy as much as possible in that age group. So uh, if you have to uh, push the button hard, it could be in the pediatric age group than in an elderly population who's what would be in my practice. Dr. Srinivas? Uh, madam, uh, uh, excellent talk uh, by both of you. Uh, wonderful. My question was, uh, say when you are putting the uh, patient on the methotrexate and if there is a, a very minimal or the mild inflammation. So when do you consider switching these patients or sorry, or adding the biologics in these patients? When when, when the first line indication for starting them on biological? Um, it's directed you, to whom are you yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or, or the speakers. Uh, whom to is directed to me? Uh, any anyone, sir, you can just go ahead. You can start. So I think is that a mild inflammation you, uh, you can persist, and we need to really think about that the side effects of the drugs also. So I keep the patients on methotrexate until unless it's really is a um, uh, problem of that one. There is a persistent flare, and looking at the macula or the vascular leakage is there. I have got a patient which I am seeing for last five years. 
he had uh, she had a uh, intermediate uveitis every time i do the fluorescent angiogram i see the capillary farning but the patient is still maintaining good vision in spite of all the immunosuppressive agents failure in the capillary farning so he was on cyclosporine and then you microfundlet and now he is on the injection adalimumab still the patient has having capillary farning so sometimes there is no really is a end point like zero um effect to be zero uh, end point to reach the inflammation so it's not really practical but uh, we need to be careful about the macular region uh, the any fluid accumulations over there like doing an oct in such cases Now, Sri was can I ask a question to both Padma and Kalpana actually? Yeah, yeah, please. Sir. How, how do you how would you define both of you? How do you define mild inflammation in your practice? Mild will be traces of cells in the anterior chamber or the vitreous haze one plus or haze zero point five. So zero point five haze and cells uh, one plus or less. Yes, I think it also depends on uh, Vinash, like the entity which you are actually looking at. You know, like for example, JIA and all that. Um, as what Padma said, you know, even a flare will be a little. Uh, I mean, I would like to control that as much as possible. Whereas if it is something else, like you know, which is an idiopathic recurrent anterior uveitis, I wouldn't really worry that much in terms of. you know the mild or you know that kind of thing but in a jia where i see a bska already coming in that is something where the disease is still active similarly in kind of vkh or so if i see um, choroidal granulomas on ffa it's still not mild no it's like uh, it is uh, definitely an important uh, thing you know parameter which we need to take so i think that kind of mild or so depends on the entity which you are dealing with and also mild in children is uh, dangerous than yeah. mild in adults yeah. so children very very difficult because invariably they go for uh, uh, band shaped keratopathy cystoid macular edema vasculitis opaque vitreous uh, so in children it is better to be little more aggressive than adults thank you so much sir. what would you do dr avinash no i think uh, for mild inflammation again the comorbidities what kalpana was mentioning is though i had mentioned about the children is already uh, i'll push the button hard for aggressive inflammation but uh, the comorbidities which can happen that's the time when i would go in for a sort of an a sort of aggressive treatment in such kind of cases but having said that uh, the worst experience i ever had was of uh, even before the covid set in was a case of mucormycosis in a diabetic patient who was immunosuppressed uncontrolled so so those are things which you occasionally we get to see those where you know for it will make us rethink about our clinical practice for some time at least yeah. yes thank you very much so we shall uh, go on to our next uh, set of speakers actually each of the talks have been really enlightening and the next uh, uh, topic is do all patients with hla b27 associated uveitis require immunomodulation and talking on this is dr partha patim who is again a senior consultant in the department of uvi and intracellular inflammation from shankar netralia and uh, countering him is dr bal murgan who is the chief of uvi services from arvind eye care uh, systems based at pondicherry so let's hear from both of them uh, good evening everyone uh, i hope my slides are visible and you can hear me Yes. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ch Chitra and the team uh, ARC for uh, having me here and giving me this opportunity. And I am also thankful for giving me this uh, very interesting topic to debate the HLA associated uh, H HLA B twenty seven associated uveitis. Now, why it is special? Because it involves the young population, so you need to be very careful, very uh, vigilant while treating this population. and the second one is it is the most common identifiable cause of uveitis in even in world or in india also so if you if we see the the epidemiology the, we can see that the uh, hla b associated uveitis accounted for 7 to 23% of total anterior uveitis cases in various tertiary institute so i'll be debating on the 
do patients with HLA B27 associated uveitis require immunomodulation? I, I'll be speaking on behalf of uh, the motion. So imagine a case scenario, Mr. X, who is down with fever, with loose motion, stomach pain, and headache for last four days. Now, how his clinician or doctor physician is treating him? He's treating with paracetamol. Every time there is a fever, he is taking paracetamol. There uh, no laboratory investigation was advised and no antimicrobial therapy was prescribed to uh, him. So the case was managed only with paracetamol. So you will be surprised that what kind of treatment is this? So the same case scenario went from fever, it, it goes to the fever of the eye. So why to treat the recurrent attacks of anterior, acute anterior uveitis with only topical steroid, which is just like a paracetamol in a case of fever. And there is no immunomodulation, there is no laboratory investigation. So this is, you are sure that this is not the right way to treat, a, treat the fever of the eye. So now, before we go into the topic, let's identify two things. Number one, identify the clinical phenotype of what we call HLA B27, UV, associated uveitis. So uh, as I said earlier, it, it involves, uh, it affects the young individuals. It is recurrent attacks. It's characterized by a full remission between the attacks. It is unilateral or most commonly it keeps alternating between the eyes. From one eye, it goes to the another eye. And the acute pattern is recognized by a triad of pain, redness, and photophobia. And uh, usually there will be high fibrin contents in the anterior chamber and hypopion can be seen in 12 to 15% of the cases. Now coming to HLA-B27, no, we don't read the laboratory test. We always try to recognize the clinical phenotype and treat them read this particular clinical phenotype. Anyway, if you read this literature, HLA typing in uveitis use and misuse, it has been said that the, a patient with recurrent, acute, unilateral, and alternating anterior uveitis is nearly 80% likely to be HLA B27 positive. But don't get uh, upset if your HLA B27 is positive, uh, sorry, negative. Because these biomarkers can be positive in later part of the disease also. Number two, you have to understand that the immunomodulation is not a rocket science. Any drug that alters the immune response is or, or altered to a desired level is called immuno, immunosuppression. And various agents have been included in this, starting from sulfa, salazine, corticosteroid, methotrexate, and TNF-alpha blocker. But for the postgraduates and the ophthalmologists, you have to remember that the immunomodulation is required in selected cases, which should be based on the recurrence, the steroid response, and the systemic comorbidities, particularly when decided by a rheumatologist. Now, 2003 years back, the father of the medicine told that the medicine is, the, is of all the arts the most noble. But owing to the ignorance of those who practice it and of those who inconsiderately form a judgment of them, it is present behind all the arts. So true this, this uh, uh, his quote is. So you have to understand ignorance is not a bliss. At least in medicine or in uveitis, there is no place of ignorance. So you have to remember when you are treating a case of recurrent attack of inflammation, what is happening? There is collateral damage to the tissues and which again lead to uh, you are treating you to with multiple times uh, topical steroid if the patient is steroid respond uh, responder then again it, it is leading to the cataract and glaucoma formation whenever there is a fibrinous content in the anterior chamber it is lead, uh, 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 going to uh, form the synechia and there will be impairment of the normal nutrition so there will be formation of the cataract there will be clogging of the trabecular meshwork outflow and there will be formation of cataract and glaucoma. So all these complications you can prevent if you can stop the recurrent attack of inflammation. And for that, you need immunomodulation. And also you have to understand that there are certain uh, uh, manifestations which are rare, but it can occur in HLA B27 associated uveitis. So some of these are like it can present with the pan uveitis and mimic the endophthalmitis. So you should not treat them with uh, thinking them as an endophthalmitis, and it can lead to hypotony, serous retinal detachment, 
there are also uh, uh, manifestations like macula uh, macu, uh, hypotonus maculopathy and then uh, vitreous hemorrhage with repeated uh, HLA-B27 associated uveitis and vasculitis. So one should be careful and treat all this with immunomodulation only. So here is a case I'll show you a 25 year old uh, young man presented to our OPD with PLPR inaccurate vision. He was a uh, diagnosed uh, HLA B27 uveitis, second, uh, developed secondary glaucoma. Unfortunately, he did not go to the uh, doctor, st started using the topical steroid because he was getting the momentary relief with the topical steroid. And uh, see, two years later, he presented to our clinic with the intercalary staphyloma. So this was the picture when he presented to our clinic. Imagine a 25-year-old uh, man. And he was carrying a CD with him. So when I inserted the CD, it, it showed me a photograph of two years back. Just here, you see the photo, uh, photograph of this patient, this young man. So we could have saved this patient's vision if we had have started the patient on immunomodulation and uh, not started him on topical steroid. So you have to understand that the immunomodulation reduces the recurrence and minimizes the risk of complication. Recently, a paper published in PLOS One, yeah, they have showed that the first-line sulfasalazine reduces the uveitis relapses and the use of anti-TNF-alpha for the ophthalmic purpose was unnecessary with rare exception. So you have to decide about this rare exception and plan this treatment with when you are deciding for the biological. But immunomodulation in all cases, when there is a recurrence attack of uveitis is must. So our mission to pre preserve the vision is, uh, when our mission is preservation of vision, then we have to remember that it is dependent on the remission. So, uh, other than immunomodulation, nothing else can help, help us to achieve this, this mission. So in, in a study, it has been seen that the 73% reduction in the inflammation was achieved with the oral methotrexate. So immunomodulation is the answer when we are uh, uh, targeting the remission. So next important point is you have to think beyond the eye. You have to understand that, that you have to, if you can diagnose systemic disease that, that may have permanent and debilitating uh, effects like bamboo spine, ankylosing spondylitis. So it has been seen that among the patients of HLA-B27 associated uveitis, two third to three fourth of these patients will have associated spondyloarthropathy. And in another important study, it has been seen that the 78% of the HLA B27 associated uveitis was associated with extraocular disorder, and 65% was diagnosed only as a result of ophthalmic consultation. So, being an ophthalmologist, there is a huge role to play here. You can actually diagnose them and send them to a rheumatologist and start the immunization. Uh, immunomodulation and prevent all this kind of permanent permanent debilitating uh, effects or systemic uh, systemic manifestation of this disease so by all of uh, to all the postgraduate you must read this this uh, duet uh, which is a uh, known as Dublin uh, UBIT's evaluation tool, which has recognized, developed, and validated the assessment algorithm for the spondyloarthropathies and HLA B27 UBITs. So this is, uh, they also found that the 40% of the patients uh, enrolled in their study uh, with acute anterior UBITs had an uh, undiagnosed spondyloarthropathy. So just to, uh, I'll finish with this duet algorithm. What it says, it says, if you are seeing a case of acute anterior uveitis, you take the history of spondyloarthropathy. There is history of spondyloarthropathy, no further workup. Treat the uveitis related to spondyloarthropathy with immunomodulation. If it is no, take the history, history of backache. If the age of onset is less than 45 years, duration is more than three months and joint pain which required to take analgesic or uh, general practitioner visit to a general practitioner. If the history is positive, then you have to check HLA-B27 positive. If the HLA-B27 is positive, then you have to start the immunomodulation. And if it is negative, you have to tell, uh, take the history that whether there is any known case of psoriasis or any, any, any uh, past medical history. If that is also not there, then you have to tell, give the patient a handout. This handout should carry the information that in future he can develop HLA-B27 positivity and require immunomodulation. And if there is no history of backache and no uh, uh, joint pain, then you, you can give him the same handout and send, send back.
with topical therapy. So yes, you look at this four picture, we can prevent, prevent these clinical conditions. Only we need is right, right amount of immunomodulation at right time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Partho. And uh, Mr. Sharik, I wanted you to keep watch on the time as always. It is six minutes. Mr. Sharik, you have not uh, followed up closely. So please be conscious henceforth. And um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And you could remind them at uh, the one minute before time. And we look forward to hearing from you, Dr. Bal Murugan. Good evening, one and all. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Chitra and the ARC team for giving me this wonderful opportunity. The very first thing I had in my mind was that uh, title given to me initially was Do all HLAB27 cases need immunomodulators? I would like to speak against for this topic. But Dr. Parto felt that, that all has to be removed. You know the reason why. I would like to start my presentation saying that whatever I speak is truth because I say what I practice, truth and truth, nothing else. I wish my opponent says the same. So this was a 52 year old female, a known case of psoriasis presenting as unilateral recurrent anterior uveitis. The patient was referred to me to start immunosuppressant to prevent recurrence. On thorough probing, we found that the patient was using bisphosphonate as a treatment for osteoporosis. So on suggesting the patient to stop this drug called bisphosphonate, which can cause drug-induced uveitis, there was no recurrence. There was no need for this patient to start on immunosuppression. So pay attention to the differential diagnosis of the disease, although the disease of psoriasis, which is a subset of HLV27, is obvious. So this was a wonderful article I came across how to forecast whether the presence of HLV27 or MRA is going to help in the diagnosis of spondyloarthritis. What this essentially says is, if you have HLV27 disease suspect, will you do MRA or an HLV27? The test, uh, the results came convincingly that the probability of the positive MRA increases from 40% to approximately 70%. But miserably, the forecasting of HLV27 fails. Not even any case definitions fail. How do you type the HLV27? There are different methods. The PCR can eliminate the false results coming by flow cytometry and MLCT tests. So we need to pay attention to this basic elementary fact. In a proven ankylosing spondylitis or HLV27 population, 80 to 90% of patients lab positive for HLV27. That means the 10 to 20 percent will test negative. 10 to 15 percent people with HLV27 gene end up developing ankylosing spondylitis. To me, this test HLV27 looks like a paper pumpkin. For what are we doing? Is it useful for diagnosis or classification? Several criteria are useful for research setting, not for clinical practice. MRA, of the axial sultan or actually B27 are important for the classification of the disease and the negative findings do not preclude a diagnosis of spondyloarthritis. Actually B27 has a close tendency to be associated with AML as well and even the carriers are associated with it. So in that scenario, your immunosuppressants can be determinable as well. Most importantly, HIV infection AIDS is also associated with actually B27 because infection with HIV predisposes to spondyloarthropathy. In fact, the class 1 HIV molecule is closely associated with the non-progression of HIV to AIDS. So you may not be able to detect HIV in HIV to 7 in the earlier stages. So be very careful in starting immunosuppression. Screening based on HIV to 7 is a futile exercise. Bayer's theorem is useful. It is useful only in the Japanese population where there is a low prevalence. Time to delineate whether you are dealing with disease associated subtype or non disease associated subtype. So, Dr. Pato showed a case of actually BD7 mimicking spondyloarthritis. I also have a recent case where they treated without immunosuppressants and they suggested it may be required for a long time. So, we do not want to start even immediately on, even in a case of 
endophthalmitis of type of presentation. When in dilemma, whether it is infection or inflammation, you will always err towards the site of infection. So that is a safer strategy. You will not harp in immunosuppressant here part two. HLA-B27 is not equal to JAR3. Immunosuppression is not the primary indication. Unlike JAUV8 is, we have to rule out the differential in the false positives. We are living in a TB endemic country. Indications of immunosuppressants are neatly enlightened by the focus initiated by the recent article where they clearly outline that the evidence and the recommendation level. And on thorough search in this article, I couldn't find out any specific mention on actually B27 on the disease entity, although it speaks of non infectious UBITs. Dr. Papa is a man of principles. When I took my mom for his expert concern, he even asked me gene proof I am my mom's child. Why then you have to do actually B27 for all patients of clinical suspect? I don't understand. If all actually B27 needs immunosuppressants, then computers is, uh, cannot be replaced after. In the words of Shashita Roh, it is a very high degree of mischievous proof grass approximation in excess shield. So when to decide on immunomodulators? This is a Roman journal of the I think Dr. Partho should be an Indian and he can't follow the Roman practice in India. And he, it says that uh, when there is some speculated association with vitamin B2 and uh, GLE is RS4752, if you do, then there is a risk of UVITIS. The secret of learning faster is we should ask why not. This is a, this is a wonderful article from Korean journal which supports my argument. It says that there is no significant difference in the BCBA and the prognosis. It is a cross-sectional study. Group 1 is B27 negative, group 2 is positive. Look at the need for immunosuppression, 5.5% in B27 positive. And even in the subtype with systemic association, it's 6.9%, less than the 7.4%. Recurrence rate is not statistically significant. No difference in the BCBA. Argument's sake, let us assume immunomodulators are the treatment of HLA B27. What all can happen? See, this was a recent article by Jessica Santa, which warned the risk of higher risk of COVID infection. Dr. Pato, I think, believes in community spread of COVID as a treatment strategy. Beware, COVID is still mutating and China is still in the lockdown. So we should not have selective amnesia when we are having double pandemics, TB, COVID. And we went back several decades in the TB control. So extending our imagination, if we start immunosuppressive or all actually B27, side of it shorter, TB reactivated, Dr. Patha will start ATD and immunosuppression. Then the patient will get COVID. Then we will go to ICU. And who will bear the cost of hospitalization? Will insurance cover? Will court of law rescue? Lawyer will ask, you have started a treatment against the standard of care. And the judge will ask, why did you not try other strategies reserved for recurrence? And the hammer will uh, appear like it is hitting on our head. Be very careful. There is something difference between expectation and reality. So I am ready to quit this case. If there is a randomized control trial on primary immunosuppression versus secondary immunosuppression in HLA-B27, unfortunately, there is nothing in this literature. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Balmurgan. That was a truly sizzling debate by both of you. And besides ophthalmology, I really enjoyed the, the way you all dealt with the topic. That was nice. And uh, But then we are, uh, this session is also a PG update uh, series. So I'm going to ask a very basic question to Dr. Ratnam. The question is, uh, what are the basic investigations would you, you would advise before we start patients on immunomodulation? How are you going to follow up these patients? And what are the investigations you would do on the follow-up also? Uh, actually, as uh, these two people informed, doing HLA -B type, actually typing is not at all needed in clinical practice. It's only for research purpose. So I never do HLA typing, which says that 90% of them are positive, 10% of them are negative, and both can have uh, eye involvement, then there is no meaning in uh, doing that. <coughs> Whenever HLA B27 patient comes, if by chance... Mute themselves, please. Yeah. Uh, if uh, the patient has neck pain or low back pain, I directly go for radio diagnosis and, and I do CT, I get rheumatology opinion. One most important thing, 
topically we can use topical steroid periocular steroid and most most important dilating agents and this alone we can take then get the rheumatologist opinion for uh, systemic immunosuppressants because if we give oral steroids they always say that they have reactive arthritis so never give oral steroid to hlb27 directly we have to or, or we have to um, handle with the topical steroid cycloplegic periocular steroid get rheumatology opinion do ct scan of the spine then um, with the rheumatologist help we will go for immunomodulators if the systemic problem is severe if there is no systemic problem at all topically we can manage topical and periocular dr avinash would you want to add something to it or shall we go on to the next question i think we can move on i think i, I just had uh, one question uh, ratna madam how commonly do we see the the poster segment manifestations in indian scenario especially when it comes to the vitritis or papillitis or pancreatitis it's, it's very rare partho partho sir it's very uh, rare it's very occasionally rare. we can have uh, macular edema otherwise it's very very rare and so, if if yes then do i think you were very very uh, relevant point actually so imagine a case of hla b27 coming to your opd so most of the time you'll there will be severe pain uh, severe pain photophobia congestion so hardly we examine the posterior segment properly or we don't uh, uh, do angiography also so if we examine the patients and there is one study i forgot so if you do a angiography there are evidences that there are there can be angiography uh, angiographically you can see the vascular inflammation so it's very difficult to say because uh, yeah as ratina madam said it is uh, clinically relevant posterior segment inflammation may be mm, very very rare but we don't know the actual picture See, if it's associated with reiters or reactive arthritis, you see more of intermediate uveitis yeah. uh, in also. these patients with HLA B twenty seven. And they, uh, I would just like to add one thing. Normally, we also get a CRP done uh, in patients with this. So, if the CRP yes. is on the higher side, then I think MRI is a yeah. good option. We we do ER, ESR, and CR. CRP. Yeah. But I think can... Dr. Bala has diverted the topic. It's not about HL doing HLA B twenty seven or not. Whether you we use immunomodulation and what are the indication, ma'am? Ratina, ma'am, when when you start uh, immunomodulation? Uh, only when they have severe systemic involvement. Okay. I have can, treated can patients add, with recurrent. There is a recurrent uh, attack. Recurrences, yeah. Multiple recurrences. I have, yeah. Yeah. Recurrences. I have seen one one that. May, three, uh, may three I add to four recurrences per year. I oh, think yeah. is a significant uh, thing. And uh, usually, when there is too many recurrences, invariably they have systemic uh, complication. Yeah. Both go in hand. One more point is, ma'am, if the patient is a steroid responder, so yeah. Then, also, yeah. Yeah. then it is immunomodulation. Absolutely. May I add a point? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. We have. Uh, yeah, you can briefly tell because we have four more yeah. speakers. Yeah. I just want to tell you that I have patients having 10, 20, 15 recurrences. Such patients you cannot live like on topical steroid on. I have seen these patients do well with methotrexate or yes. sulfasalazine. Their recurrence rate is reduced, and they are much more happy. I agree, sir. Too many recurrences. I mean, a moderator. But these patients invariably have uh, systemic finding also. thank you we shall now go on to our next set of uh, debates i think these are all highly interesting topics uh, that we had to stop somewhere so the next topic is do all patients with intraocular tb require co administration of oral corticosteroids with anti tuberculous uh, treatment and we have uh, debating on this dr sharanya uh, ibrahim who is associate consultant uveitis from shankar netralia and again the issue is going to be dr sai bhakti mishra who is a consultant from uh, uvia from narayan netralia so let's hear this uh, interesting debate on to you sharanya thank you ma'am are my slides visible yeah so uh, we'll take it as three cases which we'll discuss again in the end the first case is a patient with pan uveitis who's been on regular follow up his vision at this point was 69 n6 while on 10 mg of oral steroids he was on azoran twice a day and was on att as his tb tests were positive 
So he came back at this point with this subretinal fluid that you can see and reactivation around the scars. The scars were quite dormant for quite some time. At this point, we suspected he could have had a subretinal abscess and did an ultrasound. The second case is of a vasculitis in the right eye and a vitreous hemorrhage in the left eye. The patient was on steroid and ATT. He underwent PRP and this is how he looked. He yeah. came back well on 12.5 milligrams of steroid on Azoran twice a day and in the fourth month of ATT with a drop in vision. At this point, an OCT picked up that although the rest of his fundus looked quite stable from the vasculitis point of view, he had cystoid macular edema. The third case is a patient who was already started on ATT before he presented to us. He had a macular GHPC with lesions very close to the fovea. His vision was 6, 12, and 6. So tubercular uveitis is something that can present as both fundus lesions, anterior segment lesions, anterior uveitis, infective scleritis, a host of uh, presentations in the eye. The good thing about TB and its treatment is that the lesions either melt away completely or they scar. This is with systemic steroid. So this uveitis may be due to an active ocular infection by the tubercle bacillus or an immune-mediated reaction to latent TB infection. Prospective longitudinal studies have analyzed the presence of cyto serum cytokine profiles in patients with tubercular multifocal serpiginoid choroiditis receiving both ATT and oral steroids. So the analysis was done in two groups, those with and without paradoxical worsening. What that means is we'll come to in the next few slides. In conclusion, they found that the baseline IL-10 levels were a little higher, including early rising levels of interferon gamma and an increase in transforming growth factor beta and tumor necrosis factor alpha. All of these are uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. So these are increased after the initiation of ATT and corticosteroids. MTB in itself is capable of stimulating the release of IL-10. This is an important point when we start patients on treatment. The standard anti-tubercular treatment that we follow, the recommendation is a four-drug regimen with isoniazid, pyrazinamide, ethambutol, and rifampicin for eight weeks or two months, followed by four months of two drugs. This is applicable even in HIV-infected patients. So a paradoxical reaction while on ATT may consist of either clinical or radiological worsening of a pre-existing TB lesion or the development of a new lesion in patients who showed an initial good response. There are various hypotheses for this. One is the reconstitution of the immune response itself to treatment. The other is an elevation of the TNF alpha levels stimulated by lipopolysaccharides in the mycobacterial cell wall. This serves as an initial step in the pathogenesis of paradoxical reactions. Bacteria-laden macrophages from the alveoli might directly enter the lymphatics and circulation, thereby carrying the bacteria to the eye where the organisms persist and initiate an immune-mediated response. The common thing is the immune response. A jarish herxheimer reaction systemically has been described in syphilis very early on, and this uh, characterized by a worsening following chemotherapy. Here too, circulating uh, cytokine levels are high. Complications include all ocular neurosyphilis and cardiovascular syphilis. Steroids are known to suppress an initial JHR, and this kind of a reaction has been seen in the eye in a patient with proven cervical lymphadenopathy. The mechanism of JHR is endotoxin release, delayed hypersensitivity, and a decrease in the suppressor mechanisms. Although it is seen mostly in syphilis, other systemic diseases like leptospira, Lyme disease, systemic disease, where the worsening can be in the form of intracranial tuberculomas, meningeal disease, TB radiculitis, pleural effusion, and abnormal TB exist. These are some articles that describe a paradoxical worsening. In all, there is a worsening of the patients while on ATT, either in the form of new fundus lesions or in the form of systemic worsening, including intracranial tuberculomas. These patients are successfully treated with either intravenous or oral steroids. All of them did well with oral steroids. A recent article shows the treatment of tubercular granulomas with anti-VEGF injections along with moxifloxacin. Well, 10, 10 patients in this study, all of them received a standard care 
which is corticosteroids. So we go back to the first case. This patient, we hiked up the steroids, increased the azoran, continued the ATT. We see a resolution of the lesion with scarring. The third case also added um, oral steroid, continued the antitubercular therapy, gave him IVMP and started azoran. The lesion has disappeared. Vision is back to 6-6. In conclusion, from existing literature and clinical practice, steroids remain pivotal in the management of inflammation in TB uveitis, thereby preventing site-threatening complications from any coexistent inflammatory process. To answer the question, do all patients with intraocular TB require oral steroid with ADT? The simple answer is yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very crisp talk. And uh, shall we hear... From Dr. Sai Bhakti. Are my slides visible? Yeah. Yes. So my topic is, do all patients with uh, intraocular tuberculosis require co-administration of oral corticosteroids along with ATT? I don't think so. And I will be speaking against this. At the outset, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, AIOS ARC for this opportunity and uh, the team members of the UVR team at Narayan Nitrale and all my teachers. So tuberculosis has been a leading global cause of mortality and there has been difficulties in its eradication. This has also led to continuous surge of extrapulmonary tuberculosis of which ocular tuberculosis is, uh, uh, causes significant morbidity. However, we still have paucity of data to uh, help us have treatment guidelines and it continues the enigma of the management of this disease. The objectives of my, treat of my presentation are to discuss why we need to use corticosteroids in tuberculosis and what are the concerns, so why not to use it. Uh, a few examples of ATT monotherapy and also review of literature to support the same. And finally, I hope I will be able to coax the role of ATT monotherapy in the treatment of intraocular tuberculosis. So in, as in any infection, the treatment is, is directed towards the parasite. Similarly, in tuberculosis, we need to treat with ATT. But then why do we need a post-directed therapy or the uh, corticosteroids? This, this prospect came in when people understood that there may be a pathological aberrant immunity of the host to, my, my, to the mycobacterium tuberculosis that could cause a, a different or a variety of phenotypes, uh, phenotypic presentations. So we could uh, have the prospect of host-directed therapy that would not only augment the immunity, but also has facilitate the bacterial clearance. So corticosteroids is not used in all uh, the forms of tuberculosis in the body. In fact, it is there in the treatment guidelines of only some of the manifestations while it is contraindicated in others. So the role of corticosteroids, as we understand, I'm trying to correlate it systemically, was, is given for life-threatening conditions when there is a fear of compressive effect on the vital organs due to the inflammatory edema or prolonged inflammation can lead to sequelae formation like strictures and adhesions, or when there's a risk of paradoxical worsening. Similarly, where it is contraindicated, it is because of fear of risk of treatment failure, risk of relapse, uh, the adverse effects of steroids, and the risk of opportunistic infections and cancers, especially in immunosuppressed individuals. Coming to ocular tuberculosis, the court study found a, a varied uh, use of adjunctive therapy, or a combined therapy for ocular tuberculosis. While in Asia, more than 80% practitioners used a combined therapy. In the West, it was only about 60%. This may be attributed to the uncertainty of the diagnosis, the different genotypes of the individuals in different uh, geographic locations, and the varied uh, phenotypic presentations of ocular tuberculosis. There are these known adverse effects of corticosteroids, be it ocular or uh, uh, systemic, then again, there is a risk of failure uh, of uh, ATT when, when treated with corticosteroids because the isoniazide concentration is reduced by the use of prednisolone. This is because of enhanced rate of acetylation 
and also increased renal clearance. At the same time, rifampicin can increase steroid metabolism by inducing liver enzymes. So this, this uh, may change the, uh, the uh, levels of the ATT in the blood. And finally, there is a risk of relapse by inducing latency of tuberculosis. So next we come to the topic of ATT monotherapy. So if we don't give corticosteroids, will ATT monotherapy work in patients with ocular tuberculosis? Yes, it can work because there is evidence of role of direct and microbial infection in uh, ocular tuberculosis. Then here we must also acknowledge the inherent anti-inflammatory properties of rifampicin. There's lack of evidence of beneficial effect of combined therapy in literature. And some reports also suggest that corticosteroid therapy, particularly when started prior to ATT, have resulted in poor, poorer final outcomes. So if we consider the COD study, which strongly recommends adjunctive therapy, the meta-analysis, which shows that uh, ultimately there is no influence on final outcomes, some of our personal experience and other reports, we, uh, we will understand that certain forms of ocular, ocular tuberculosis can respond to ATT monotherapy alone. So this is one patient with of a 28 year old male who had decrease in vision in the right eye since one month. Uh, he was positive on one two and uh, chest imaging. He had a solitary choroidal granuloma, which responded to DOTS regimen and resolved with minimal scarring. If that was a small lesion, this is a larger, almost a four disc diameter lesion. It was a large choroidal granuloma with a subretinal abscess, which was treated with ATT alone for nine months and resolved with minimal scarring. So is this only us or has or uh, are other people also finding these? So anti-TB monotherapy was studied for choroidal tuberculomas in this observational study, where two groups, uh, one of monotherapy and one of combination therapy were assessed. And interestingly, they found that anti-TB monotherapy is sufficient for the treatment of choroidal tuberculoma, and monotherapy can lead to faster resolution without compromising visual outcomes. Yeah, so the next is for isolated tubercular ret retinal vasculitis. This was a larger study of 50 eyes where they took comparable uh, cases of, uh, of retinal vasculitis and they found that ADT monotherapy had no influence on resolution, healing pattern or vasoocclusive compl com vaso complications. So what does the future look like? We are moving from a conventional treatment to contemporary treatment. Now we have these highly vascular TB granulomas which benefit from local anti-VEGF uh, therapy, though it for now, it is combined with uh, systemic immunosuppression, but I don't think we are far from uh, the days when we might be giving intravitreal ATT and anti-VEGF for only ocular tuberculosis without any active systemic infection. So which phenotypes of ocular tuberculosis need for administration of corticosteroids is still not, it, this topic is under-researched and there are no clear-cut guidelines. But if I draw the corollary from the systemic use of corticosteroids and our experience, we understand that oral corticosteroids are required only in select cases uh, where there is site threatening conditions with juxtafovial or juxtapapillary lesions, where there is optic disc involvement, vitritis more than two plus or uh, case of paradoxical worsening. Only these cases we need to give uh, oral corticosteroids to avoid the risk of unnecessary use. So all patients with intraocular tuberculosis do not require co-administration of oral corticosteroids with ATT. Uh, to summarize, we, are still, we still have unclear pathomechanisms of different phenotypes of ocular tuberculosis. There is no conclusive evidence yet of the benefit of using adjunctive, uh, of the adjunctive role of corticosteroids. However, we run the risk of corticosteroid-induced adverse effects. Now, guidelines that, uh, that we follow are, cannot be all-inclusive, all and we, we need to uh, watch out on case-by-case -case basis with respect to inflammatory signs and site-threatening lesions. Thank you. That was a lovely talk, Dr. Sai Bhakti, and uh, uh, very informative. So let me just take my question a little uh, differently and uh, more basic. So if you are, uh, Dr. Avinash, I'm going to ask you that question. If you are going to start oral steroids with anti-tuberculous uh, treatment, uh, what would be the time gap before which, when you would decide to start oral steroids? And is there one single test to, to diagnose uh, uh, tu tuberculosis before we start medication, does mantoos have a role? I want to answer for all the questions. There are three questions. <laughs> tiny, no. tiny answers. Yeah. So, uh, in terms of, uh, in, in the world of uh, the treatment for infectious disease, uh, people are always divided whether to start corticosteroids in the management of infection. So, that debate would always continue whether to start or not to, or not to uh, start. 
and that's how both the speakers have put forth their points uh, uh, in a very beautiful way. Now, having understood that, uh, that this debate is going to continue, uh, like Sai and, and uh, Sharanya both brought out that there would be an element of an hypersensitivity reactions which do happen in these cases where the role of corticosteroids uh, would be there in these cases. So, you know, what are those cases where hypersensitivity reactions would be there and I would use corticosteroids in my practice? Uh, I would say three important conditions. One is if they present with a morphological pattern of serpiginoid like choroidopathy. And second, if there's a paradoxical worsening and uh, and in third condition, if it's associated with retinal vasculitis. So these are three indications where I'm extremely clear. And, and also where I'm extremely clear where I would reserve the steroids, where I would start on ATT would be the unifocal choroiditis and associated with subretinal abscess. There I'm extremely clear I would be starting with ATT, though if it is even very close to the fovea, I want to see some sort of response happening then uh, I, it's fine then in, in extensive spread and going in for certain cases like a panophthalmitis, which can happen. Now, uh, that would answer the first question. And the second one, when would I start if I have to start? So in the first case where those three indications, what I mentioned, the serpiginoid lacrodopathy, I would start simultaneously along with antitubercles treatment. And uh, even in paradoxical reaction where you would amount to increasing the steroids than conventionally what the patient is on, and hypersensitivity reaction, which is vasculitis, I would start concomitantly with uh, the ATT. So, and the third question was? Would you, uh, is there one single test for? Uh... A single test. So, uh, single test, I would I would put uh, test, yes. I, would, I primarily rely on MANTU is the one which is for systemic investigation. But clinical features of three important signs which I have elucidated before, which is something which I'll go behind to make a diagnosis the posterior manifestations. So clinical signs first and investigations number two. That uh, covered it. Uh, Srinivas, shall we take, uh, go on to the next talk and you take the question for that? Uh, just one quick question. Uh, Dr. Sai, uh, as you said that monotherapy in one of your case examples, you showed that the juxta foveal lesion, right? And you showed that, that as a monotherapy. But again, while ending, you concluded in your slide where the steroids have to be started in juxta papillary and juxta foveal lesions. What uh, school of thought I read was in any where there is a papillary or uh, perifoveal or uh, parafoveal or, or juxta foveal, steroids should be included in those uh, things. Now, I'm a little bit confused uh, with these things. So can, can anyone just clarify? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. If the uh, choroidal uh, tubercular granuloma is over the disc, steroid is extremely important. Because if, if we have a reactivation, immediately the patient will go for uh, both CRAO and CRVO. In one day, patient will become no PL. So if the granuloma is over the disc, steroid is extremely important in the dose of 60 milligram. Because even given decadron uh, injection three days, because we don't want to uh, have uh, occluded vessels because of optic nerve swelling. As you rightly mentioned, juxtra papillary and juxtra foveal definitely need steroids. I have given intravenous methylprednisolone in the juxtra foveal, juxtra papillary yeah. lesions, and then combined with the ATT therapy, even there's Mantu quantiferon TB gold test is positive. This is indicated to save the fovea or disc. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, we shall now go on to our next uh, set of topic. Uh, uh, fluorescent uh, angiography versus ICG in diagnosis of uveitis. And we have uh, Dr. Anamika Patel, who is a consultant uh, with retinal diseases and uvea and immunology from Ishaka Patnam. And countering her would be Dr. Anu, who is uh, again a consultant ophthalmologist with retinal diseases from uh, LV Prasad Bhuvneshwar. So let's hear both of them. Young blood, so I think there's going to be even greater fire here. Thanks, Dr. Chitra and uh, the AIS ARC team for giving us the opportunity to speak. Uh, and this happens to be my favorite topic, the fluorescein in the diagnosis of uveitis. So let's get started. So um, I have two questions for my very dear friend Anoop here that Anoop, do you really feel that you need ICG in making a diagnosis of uveitis? That was question one. And second question is, 
do you think you have any kind of an established protocol in the treatment and the follow up of your uveitis patients based solely on the icg uh, you keep on thinking about it and let me quote uh, carl herbert's uh, paper on fluorescein and endocyanin brain angiography for uveitis and uh, i think everybody would agree with me is kind of a no brainer schematic diagram where uh, it beautifully describes how fluorescein gives the information on almost everything starting from the nve to retina to retinal vessel cloridal neovascularization nvd subretinal fluid all of us can read that and how uh, icg is solely kind of uh, near only near the choroid so uh, i think i have made my case but uh, i still have some more time so let's get started so uh, for any person who contests that why uh, icg is better than ffa let me give all of you here who have that thought in their mind the five pointers first is kind of theory theoretical and the rest all are clinical so if you look at the molecule the fluorescein sodium as we know it it's a micromolecular in behavior because it's 80% bound in compared to icg which is a macromolecule now fluorescein uh, sodium molecule it entirely predominates the retinal circulation and that's the reason why you see leakages kind of everywhere but uh, if you feel uh, that you do not get any info on choroid so that thought is not correct because in the early frames up till the 60 second you still get some information on the choroid capillaris so uh, that was a theoretical point and rest all other clinical points so uh, if you have uh, a suspicion of any subtle disease activity this leakage is seen better on ffa if you feel that there is the presence of this uh, slight vasculitis and you you have a doubt of neovascularization as you can see how beautifully you can pick up the neovascularization better on ffa anup i'm sure you must have done some lasers for your retinal vasculitis patients when they have come up with the new vascularization and i hope uh, you have done uh, ffa rather than icg to appreciate the cnp and to do the laser guided photocoagulation now i'm sure all of us know about the mutes and the beautiful wreath is picked up only on ffa and the other point about this beautiful pinpoint hypofluorescence which you get to see both in the vkh and the posterior scleritis is seen best on ffa uh this is the last point of which about the treatment response so uh this is my patient a pediatric patient i would say who had presented with this picture and here you can see that how she had the hot disc so start macular edema and this beautiful ferning all over and how over a period of time everything got resolved so this was done on ffa picked up on ffa and not on icg point being the disc leak forming pattern and cme they all are better appreciated on ffa so this guides me my on my treatment and to recognize what i am dealing with so i hope if you are still thinking that i see hypos on my icg let me show you this uh, comparative uh, you know image here that this ffa shows you your hypos and this icg also shows you the hypo maybe you can just count maybe uh, three or four extra hypos but uh, having said that do you feel that you are going to change your uh, diagnosis or the treatment approach to the patients when you see something like this only on ffa so well ffa is time tested it's a gold standard investigation it helps you in complementing your clinical suspicion and i feel and i urge this the uveitis or the people here that i'm sure i can assure you that the absence of icg is not going to create a gaping hole in anybody's uveitis practice so i know i rest my case here over to you thank you thank you dr anamika so let's you can't let her win dr anu so yeah something. i'm just uh, sharing the presentation Yeah, is it visible? Yeah. 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 Thanks. Oh, uh, thanks, Anamika, for uh, those questions. And I feel of all the uh, debates today, uh, this is a greatly skewed one because I found nothing wrong with your presentation per se. Uh, and I hope that's the case here also. This FFA versus ICG is so uh, skewed a debate uh, and so skewed a thing in UVITs, especially like it's. uh combining both empire and the first order against a little baby yoda just to say uh it's a younger sibling of uh, ffa i give you that 
it's it was it was introduced later than FFA. And if you just Google uh, FFA versus ICG, this was ICG comes up only four hundred and forty seven thousand times, while FFA is uh, has two million hits on uh, Google. Uh, similarly, we have lot less number of uh, publications on PubMed, both in UVRS and non-UVRS thing uh, on on uh, published literature. So, do we have enough data to say ICG is poor or uh, better? I, I I doubt. So, it's a younger sibling, and when I would use the word sibling, it's uh, I guess ICG is not separable from FFA. I give you that. A uh, second thing, when you want to image uh, choroid. What do you do? Yeah, uh, if I want to see wild animals, I would like to go to the jungle than uh, see it in a zoo. And ICG has a better penetration. Uh, so if you see this, this was a case of uh, VKH, and uh, I give it to FFA that disc, retina, outer retina, and RP is definitely imaged uh, a lot better on angiography, and it uh, takes up very nicely the retinitis lesion identification. Uh, pinpoint leakages, vasculitis, everything is there. What it cannot see is the jungle behind. Uh, it cannot see the, the smaller granulomas. It cannot see that there is a, a choroidal vessel inflammation. And that's a very important thing that uh, it brings to our minds. It might not give every patient a clinical advantage, but it definitely adds to the scientific knowledge that there is, uh, you know, choroidal inflammation. These vessels are in fact hyper, and uh, both the excitation and emission spectrums of this is in the infrared spectrum, and like the and like the angiography, which helps it to uh, penetrate the RP uh, till some extent. Heme exudates and even melanin can be penetrated by by these waves uh, of ICG. And again, I was saying you, when imaging choroid on angiography, the big problem is uh, retinal pigment epithelium. We have uh, window defects through which we can see sometimes uh, staining of the scars or uh, RP in the mid or late phases has problems. Pinpoint leakages uh, at the level of RP has problems of uh, imaging. It's like uh, this picture again, where you see some kind of a uh, hypo are seen on angiography, but it's like looking from the ground through a telescope, through all of that atmosphere and it's uh, problems hidden therein. And how do we get a better look at choroid? Like they found out just the Hubble uh, telescope, put it out of the atmosphere, uh, bypass the RP and get the image that you have a oh, choroidal inflammation. And still better, like the recently uh, launched James Webb uh, telescope, we have an optus or uh, any wide field imaging where you can have a much wider view nowadays, uh, where in this case of toxoplasma, where you could see a, a more than a involvement of choroid than you could see on either angiography or clinical photograph. So it nowadays given gives an a wider extent as well. And this was also a point that you mentioned that it's the truest extent of the disease, especially the choroid, is given by none other than ICG. Yes, it could be few uh, spots here and there, uh, but details matter. And uh, coming to the next thing, it really scores if, if it's any one disease, I would pick VKH for that. And I guess this would be uh, applicable for cases of sympathetic ophthalmia as well. Uh, given the clarity. And uh, these are the four points that are seen other than the diffuse delayed coral perfusion. I'll cover this in more details next two slides. The first is uh, ICG use a marker of acute disease, uh, disc hyper and disc, uh, these are the coral vessel hyperfluorescence that we get to see in an acute disease. Uh, however, these are not seen in chronic uh, diseases. Also, we have two clues for an underlying inflammation. One is this hypofluorescent dark dots, and other it lays late fuzziness of cordial stromal vessels. Now, uh, Anavika questioned me that what are the cases in which I would really like to go for an ICG? And over the, over the past couple of years, I've developed this particular algorithm for myself and uh, to the residents listening today, uh, it would be, this would be the slide I will uh, carry home. So I do it, especially in the cases with or typical cases where either I clinically see it to be asymmetrical or clinically unilateral uh, disease to look for the cordial involvement. 
or if in very rare cases there are dyskidema and hyperemia only as a presentation which is quite rare uh, subclinical activities again a very big point where i do icg uh, where we see continued depigmentation or sunset glow despite you having been on treatment and the second point in the subclinical is helping nowadays a lot that is when tapering the systemic immunosuppression when the patient has been on two to say two years three years plus and i want to taper the dose uh, of the immunosuppression i uh, nowadays have started doing an icg of course with an ffa uh, to to see that there is really no subclinical activity and also cases of recurrence of vkh at most of the times are anterior and uh, icg is helping me to see that on the any involvement as well the fifth point i want to stress is this is one area the tuberculoma though clinically there are vitreatis other signs of inflammation very rarely it could be a differentiation from a melanotic melanoma might be a necessity the difference is uh, tuberculoma stays hypo throughout uh, early and late on icg while uh, a melanotic melanoma will be otherwise it would have uh, vasculature inside on icg and uh, other things so this is one more area where if a silent sitting tuberculoma is there and the diagnosis is uh, uh, is a query this would this would help the the sixth point is uh, this dye there is very less extravasation of the dye from uh, the vasculature and like we have uh, all of this leakages at on ffa uh we get a uh, minimal uh, extravasation of the dye and we can see the choroidal vessels quite clearly as opposed to uh, the ffa so in summary icg depicts depicts the extent of choroidal involvement uh, better than ffa uh, especially two things that stand out on icg are granulomas and uh, choroidal vascular inflammation so really the idea of vascular inflammation might not be given exactly by uh, by the ffa and the last point is the icg is nowadays helping me and uh, recently have published articles as well the subclinical choroidal involvement which is better than uh, better than ffa uh, yeah thanks everyone i would like thank especially uh, to to thank uh, dr chitra and uh, and the team for giving me the opportunity to present this especially before this uh, august panel thank you very much dr anup both you and anamika were absolutely strong and clear about the message you wanted to cross so i'm now going to uh, bring that discussion up i'm going to ask ratnam one very simple question would oct angiography uh, replace ffa and icg any your thoughts on that no ffa is most important uh, srinivas you have any question uh, sir avina sir i just want to ask about these two things Hey, uh, when when you know that in case of uh, uh, choroidal capillaritis, they consider the mutes or uh, the APMPP. In those cases, I agree with Anup that they have a very uh, a clear distinction of the lesions, especially when you are treating these diseases, because sometimes the FFA gives a very a fuzzy this thing and uh, uh, reactionary leakage happens, pooling happens. So, how will you monitor the treatment aspect of the, uh, especially in case of choroidal capillaritis? i think icg still holds a uh, hand better as compared to the ffa although faf is a game changer but when the debate comes only between the ffa and the icg uh, what would you uh, really like to prefer sir so my one answer ffa that's it so my answer is ffa icg both <laughs> ratinam madam ffa mm. i think it would depend on what is the uh, disease we are dealing with if it is primarily a retinal disease we would prefer ffa and when we are looking at choroidal granulomas or a suspicion of choroidal it is icg so it cannot be one for all for vasculitis i don't need a ffa icg but other conditions i need a ffa and icg both uh, uh, choroidal infiltration because of muskrat syndrome icg is very important thank you a um, lot of information came through this debate we shall now go on to our next uh, topic uh, is oral gan gan cyclovir or intravitreal gan cyclovir in the management of cmv retinitis and we have uh, dr megha gulati who is a consultant in vitreal retina services and uvr and immunology from visakhapatnam and countering her is dr malika goel who is a senior consultant heads the retina vitreous and uveitis services at apollo eye hospital hyderabad 
So let's hear this interesting debate. Thank you, Dr. Chitra. Am I audible? Good evening to all. Am I audible now? Yes, yes, yes Dr. Mega, go ahead. Is my screen visible in the slide? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. So uh, starting with the topic CMV retinitis. So this disease, it is characterized by progressive necrotizing retinitis, which can lead to blindness in patients who have immunocompromised status. And it can be seen as an AIDS-related CMV retinitis or non-AIDS-related, especially in patients who are on pharmacological immunosuppression. Now, in 1980s, before the starting of uh, heart therapy, the FDA-approved drug was intravenous gancyclovir in the induction uh, course of uh, CMV retinitis. And for the maintenance, we had oral gancyclovir. Now, the problems which were there was the need for catheterization for intravenous gancyclovir and very poor bioavailability of oral gancyclovir. And it has a side effect, which is myelosuppression. So to overcome this uh, catheterization issue and the oral bio bioavailability, the Val Easter of gancyclovir was introduced. And the, my, to overcome this myelosuppression, the first case in which the intravital gancyclovir was used was a patient who was having a pre-existing myelosuppression and developed CMV retinitis. So now let's come to our topic, oral valve gancyclovir or it's intravital gancyclovir, which is better. Now, before I start with my topic, I would like just to start with a simple example and I would like to give the scenario to you. Patient presented to the clinic uh, with this uh, clinical picture of diabetic retinopathy, PDR status. Now, this yeah. patient, what treatment will you advise? Whether it will be just an intervital anti vegf injection or would you also counsel the patient to control diabetes mellitus and visit his diabetologist? Because the patient is also at risk of involvement of multi-organs because of the diabetes mellitus. In same analogy, CMV retinitis. What should be the management? It should be only intervital gancyclovir or also systemic anti-CMV therapy because whether the patient is HIV or non-HIV, it has a risk of extraocular CMV involvement. So let's start. This question does not hold valid. This option of or should not be there, but let's see which is better. Now I will answer this question with the help of four questions. How effective is oral valgancyclovir over systemic gancyclovir? CMV retinitis, is it just a unilateral or a bilateral presentation? Does CMV has only ocular involvement? And what are the indications of intravital gancyclovir or specifically the combined therapy? Let's start with the first question. How effective is oral valgancyclovir over systemic gancyclovir? Now, you can see this area under plasma concentration in time curve. It is comparable between oral valgancyclovir and intravenous gancyclovir. So studies have proved the bioequivalence, efficacy, and safety of oral valgancyclovir over intravenous gancyclovir as well as oral gancyclovir. Coming to the second question, CMV retinitis is a unilateral or a bilateral presentation. Now in almost two thirds of the patients who present with CMV retinitis, it's the unilateral presentation, but it can become bilateral if not treated appropriately because CMV retinitis occurs via the hematogenous dissemination to the eye. Now, in patients who were only treated with intraocular treatment, studies have reported that there was an increase of almost 22 to 35% in the incidence of new CMV retinitis and the untreated contralateral eye. And what was the primary risk factor? So the risk factor which was associated with high involvement of the contralateral eye was the low CD4 count and a high CMV load. So to treat the low CD4 count and the high CMV load, there is a role of systemic anti-CMV therapy and heart initiation, especially with the immune reconstitution. So the bilateral involvement or the contralateral eye involvement can be, the incidence can be reduced by starting proper systemic anti-CMV therapy and the antiretroviral therapy. Coming to the third question, does CMV has only ocular involvement? So retinitis, it is the most common clinical manifestation of CMV, but it's a multi-organ involvement. And to give a few examples, it can present as encephalitis, ventriculitis, pneumonia in form of lung involvement, adrenalitis, and gastrointestinal involvement in form of esophagitis and colitis. So studies have shown that the patients who were treated with only the sustained release implant 
The biopsy of such patients has shown that 31% of these patients had evidence of systemic CMV disease, which was left untreated. So having answered the three important questions, how is oral valgan cyclovir important? Is it only unilateral or bilateral presentation? Or is it only ocular or also extraocular involvement? Let's see the me. indications of intravital GAN cyclovir or combined therapy. Now, no drug is free of side effects. So GAN cyclovir has myelosuppression. But neutropenia was seen in only 11 to 13% of the patients. So indications of combined or only intravital therapy can be zone 1 CMV retinitis. When there is pre-existing myelosuppression or renal failure, such patient needs dose adjustment. So low dose valgan cyclovir can be given with intravital therapy. And in patients who are pregnant or due to socioeconomic consideration when the patient can't afford the systemic treatment. So what did we learn by answering these four questions? So I would like to conclude that oral valgan cyclovir for CMV retinitis mainly reduces the mortality visceral CMV disease and dissemination to the second eye, in addition reduces the pill burden and the intravenous catheterization. I would like to conclude with the statement that CMV retinitis is just an ocular manifestation of a systemic disease. Here we have the opportunity to treat this opportunistic infection and let's not miss it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a simple question and Srinivas can take the rest. For CMV retinitis, how long should we continue the medication? So CMV retinitis, as I told you, the primary risk factor is a CD4 count. So it has an induction and a maintenance dose. The induction it is, for the induction, we are giving oral valgan cyclovir in a dose of 900 mg BD for three weeks. And the maintenance dose, it depends upon how the CD4 count improves with initiation of heart and valgan cyclovir. So the CD4 count improves to more than 100 then it has to be continued for six months in a dose of 900 mg OD. But if the immune ED constitution is better and the CD4 count is improving to more than 200 after initiating heart, then we can continue the maintenance therapy in form of 900 mg OD for three months. Srinivas, anything to ask before no, we No, I think we'll uh, hear the opponent, now, madam, first. Malika, madam. And yeah. then we can... I know. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Malika. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, Chairman ARC and the entire team for this opportunity. I heard with interest uh, Dr. Gulati's comments, so I will answer those later. Um, now, I have a lot of experience with this because I was associated with a lot of AIDS patients in uh, AIDS Control Society of uh, Andhra Pradesh. First thing to understand is it is a virostatic drug, gancyclovir or well gancyclovir. So it does not eradicate the virus. We have to continue treatment till the patient's immune system can take over. Now, what are the advantages of intraocular gancyclovir? It provides a higher and targeted concentration of the drug so that it arrests the activity almost immediately, preventing progression. And hence, the treatment duration <clears throat> with intraocular gancyclovir is only two months, whereas it is around 4.5 months with systemic treatment. And uh, the disease-free time also lengthens with intraocular gancyclovir. And treatment failure is rare. So what would be the indications of intraocular gancyclovir, keeping in mind those advantages? One is where there is macula threatening, uh, zone one retinitis, or when you need to operate for retinal detachment and you need to clear the retinitis urgently, extensive retinitis, very low CD4 counts, and suspected gancyclovir resistance, interestingly. It has been found that intraocular gancyclovir is effective even in cases where there is suspected resistance to gancyclovir and healing is observed within two weeks to four weeks in all cases with intraocular gancyclovir, not systemic. Well, again, now this is a patient uh, with macula threatening uh, retinitis, recent patient, and uh, we put, uh, put him on oral valgan to avoid injections, but it was uh, worsening rapidly and there was a suspicion of resistance as well in this case as per the ID physician. So we then added uh, intraocular gancyclovir and you can see the rapid resolution following which we kept him on oral valgan cyclovir. Similarly, these are cases where required surgery, they come with retinal detachment and extensive retinitis, immediate resolution with injection. Lady with retinal detachment and you see the extensive retinitis and within a week uh, of uh, injections, you can see the marked resolution of the retinitis allowing us to operate the next day. And uh, in less than three weeks, the patient is doing excellent simply because of the intravitreal injections. 
Another patient, similar situation, macula threatening as well as extensive inferior retinitis, high risk of RD from the extensive retinitis. We tried oral Valgan, but uh, there was hardly any resolution. So switched to intravitreal and you can see within a week of switching, uh, the res complete resolution and four weeks later, no activity. So now we switched her back to oral Valgan and within four weeks, there was recurrence of activity. You can see there, hemorrhage is starting, etc. But this we were able to tolerate. Now, uh, the treatment is longer with oral valgan cyclovir or any systemic disease, which allows the disease to progress, leading to extensive involvement. And more extensive involvement increases the risk of retinal breaks and detachment. Also, extensive causes more of immune recovery inflammation and allows macular involvement. But more importantly, when we have subtherapeutic vitreous drug levels, which systemic treatment uh, causes, we have higher chances of creating a GAN cyclovir resistance, which was not there, relapses in the retinitis, and often treatment failure, which I already showed you. So this is where you have very extensive active disease. And then if you allow the disease to smolder, you have large areas of retina disappearing with retinal breaks and detachments. Similarly, patients on Valgan cyclovir, almost 85% will have relapses during their treatment uh, at an average of about three months from starting the treatment, which is not the case with intravitreal therapy. Then the systemic problems with Valgan cyclovir are severe anemia, uh, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia because of bone marrow suppression, which the heart also causes bone marrow suppression, zidovudine. So this drug should not be given with zidovudine, which most patients are already on for the, uh, for the HIV. And both together can cause severe uh, myelosuppression. So it needs weekly monitoring of blood counts. It is contraindicated in pregnancy and with renal function impairment. On the other hand, intraocular gancyclovic suffers from no such systemic adverse effects and can be used with zidovudine. Now, another huge factor which comes into play is the cost. Uh, the cost of intravitreal therapy is almost negligible compared to the cost of valgancyclovir. What costs per month with intravitreal costs per day with oral valgancyclovir? Because a single vial costs only about 900 to 1800 rupees, which can be reconstituted and used for up to four weeks easily which is what I have done always uh, with no problems, whereas oral is costly. So what is the benefit of oral valgan cyclovir? As uh, Dr. Gulati had mentioned, it prevents systemic disease and fellow eye disease in most of the patients. So that is the only one uh, advantage. And the disadvantage of intraocular is uh, injections in children can be difficult and adverse effects of any intravitreal injection. So what can we agree to? Uh, uh, well, actually both have their advantages. So just the fact that we are giving intravitreal gancyclovir does not mean that systemic is not required and both can go on at the same time. The systemic protecting the fellow eye from uh, disease. Um, and it can also be sequential combined treatment where you give intravitreal till the disease is inactive and then carry on with oral valgancyclovir as a maintenance therapy. And then finally, when we see a given patient, none of these things work. What we have to see is what works in that situation, which depends on location, extent of retinitis, severity of retinitis, the status of patient's immune competence, concomitant medications which cause myelosuppression, and affordability. Thank you. And Thanks, Dr. Malika. That was If time permits, I'll also. Oh, you wanted to show the slide. Yeah. yeah sorry. Yeah, yeah. You have something to. Sh yeah, I was. Yeah, I was saying that I would like to answer certain of the uh, certain points which Dr. Glati had mentioned. Uh, she was talking about uh, systemic disease of CMV. That's very true theoretically, but uh, practically, in my experience as well as literature, does not support systemic prophylaxis for CMV unless there is confirmed disease which requires management. So prophylaxis with valgan cyclovir for preventing extraocular disease is not required even in severely immunosuppressed patients. Now, even if there is a bilateral disease, uh, if, both, if both eyes are having a macula threatening uveitis, uh, retinitis, or both are having extensive retinitis, which can cause detachment, then both need injections. So very often I give bilateral injections, not the same day maybe, separated, but bilateral, because each eye has to be preserved. So just because it is bilateral, it doesn't mean that valgan cyclovir will be indicated. It depends on the severity of disease in that eye. If urgent treatment is required, bilateral treatment is required. These are the points that I had in mind. Srinivas, anything to ask? 
uh, good presentation, madam. Uh, I think uh, that was uh, really wonderful from both of you. We all know that the bioavailability of the, the oral valkin sector is pretty much good. Penetration is good. Uh, so uh, still, do we need to add a little more was my first question. And second thing is I want to ask the panelists that how often we check that zidobudine is being asked in cases where the oral valkin sector is being given because I've seen most of the empirically uh, starting them on oral valagan cyclovir when the patients are on NRIs uh, uh, and uh, we usually don't check because they go to the government setup and they say that I am on the heart therapy and uh, we are, uh, and usually we don't check there uh, most of the times we, we don't do it and how often it is uh, dangerous to uh, not give an oral valagan, uh, uh, valagan cyclovir when uh, the zidobudine is there in their treatment. Can I answer the first one at least? Yeah, yeah, sure. So the bioavailability of valgan cyclovir is only 60% of what it would be for intravenous gancyclovir. So it's not too great. Uh, and it is nowhere comparable to intravitreal gancyclovir injection. It is not comparable. So to think that because we are giving oral valgan, uh, what is the advantage of intravitreal? There is no comparison. There is no comparison. I showed you macular retinitis worsening on valgan. In fact, most of the cases that I see, they just don't do good on oral valgan alone. Most of the time we do have to <clears throat> supplement with intravitreal to at least initially to control the disease with three to four injections. And then valgan is able to maintain that status. So there is no comparison in the uh, intravitreal concentration. Second was the zidovidin C. Ideally we should- And, and your frequency would be uh, twice a day, uh, once in three days? Frequency, yeah. Initially the induction dose is set to be one to uh, once in three days for uh, till you find activity resolved. And then after one to two weeks, you can go to once a week. But now uh, we can use, uh, there is a concept of using higher dose, six mg per injection rather than two mg. In that case, we can just give once a week, even in the induction phase, injection of six or five or six mg, and then shift to two mg per week. So once a week, sure. even initially. Uh, then to talk about zidovudine, how many of us asked? See, point is we should not be adding systemic drugs like valgan cyclovir without having any consultation with the treating physician or seeing the treating drug because drug interactions are known. So we are, we are not even supposed to actually do that independently. Or if we do it, it should be after seeing what the patient is already using. And that applies not only to this situation, but any situation. When we write a drug, we have to know what other drugs are going on. We cannot allow uh, duplication or con inter con you know, interactions. So that uh, that should not happen. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yes. Has uh, Dr. Malika been quite clear? Shall we go on to the last topic? I don't think there's any controversy. No, we usually we give that uh, intravitreal injection. That's quite sure. effective. But uh, continuation of the treatment, like you know, maintenance therapy, we use that oral uh, valgan cyclovir. Yes, correct. So we go on to our last uh, set of talk, uh, which is uh, IUL with intravitreal steroid versus IUL without intravitreal steroid in management of complicated cataract post uveitis. And we have talking on this Dr. Ketan, who's a vitreal retina consultant practicing at Nagpur, Apollo Clinic. And uh, we have uh, talking against it is Dr. Tenerson, who's a consultant in vitreal retina services and UVA at the Eye Foundation group of hospitals. So let's hear both of them. Dr. Ketan? Dr. Ketan is not there. Srinivas? Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes madam. He is there. Yes, Dr. Ketan, please go. Can share your screen. Carrying my screen, just as. Is my screen visible? What's happening? I'm uh, just give me a second.
it's taking a little time then can we go with thena rasan madam is it uh, visible now no 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 not, not yet uh, uh, you should have opened up your presentation sinas could you guide him yeah uh, now 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 it is clean up yes please go ahead so, good evening everybody thank you dr chitra and i'm sorry for the delay and the members of the arc for this wonderful learnings over the course of these debates which actually happen in a clinician's head every time we see these patients in the clinic i appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this forum the topic that i'm speaking today is about uvit cataract surgery with or without steroids and i would be giving my arguments in favor of using intravitreal steroids for cataract surgery in uvit patients UVIT cataracts and their managements have always been a double edged sword. Cataract causes a drop in vision, but the cataract surgery itself has its own perils, most feared amongst which is the recurrence of inflammation. Around 1 in every 8 patient would have a recurrence of inflammation in the first month itself, while almost half the patients show recurrence by the end of the first year. second complication is about cystoid macular edema which happens in about 30 to 50% of these patients along with these two other vision limiting complications that an early pco formation iol deposits as well as enerm formation tends to happen in these patients so it's clearly a regular run of the mill cataract surgery is not going to cut it in these patients so in these patients especially in these patients steroids come to a rescue with perioperative steroids playing a major major role in li limiting the vision uh, deterioration in these patients to some extent whether now the question arises whether we go for the systemic steroids or the local depot steroids so let's objectively judge each of them on the three parameters that ensure better quality of vision to the patients the improvement in vision the recurrence of inflammation post cataract surgery and the cystoid macular edema and lastly but importantly what is the price that the patient pays in terms of side effects for using these treatment modalities and coming to the first parameter okravi et al showed that 89.5% of these patients achieve a better visual acuity of 20 40 or better with ivt while well, dada et al compared ivt as well as systemic steroids and showed that 75% achieved 20 40 or better vision with ivta as compared to 65% patients with systemic steroids the next parameter is recurrence of inflammation especially in the first 3 months which is the critical period post cataract surgery we can see a massive 56% of the patients recurring which are not on perioperative steroids as was also seen in the first slide however it is here when ivta truly shines because in patients who received perioperative ivta the chances or the recurrences of inflammation within the first 3 months is almost zero while with systemic steroids it is more than 20% in the first 3 months coming to the next parameter the cystoid macular edema cme is the most common cause for unimproved vision post cataract surgery rosette et al found that ivta is more effective in preventing cystoid macular edema compared to oral steroids or even orbital flow trimsinolone injections now having studied the three performance parameters ivta comes across as a better option across all these parameters while well, coming to the side effects let's discuss the systemic steroids first the list is literally exhaustive where i can just list all the complications of systemic steroids for the entirety of the 6 minutes that i have prominent among these include weight gain deranged sugars gastric ulcers osteoporosis and the list keeps going on when it comes to intravitreal steroids let's address the elephant in the room iop rise post ivt the sphere of iop rise is what deters most surgeons from using ivt and rightly so as i'm sure all of us must have dealt with steroid responders in our clinic at some point or the other so the question is not whether iop increases or iop increase happens post cataract surgery yes it does the question is we need to understand whether the iop the benefits that the ivta gives do it supersedes the benefits uh, of the iop rise does the three parameters that improve with ivta supersedes the risk of an iop rise 
So coming to the IOP spike, when it comes to intravitreal steroids, yes, it leads to an about 25 to 26 percent of these patients show an IOP increase as compared to systemic steroids where around 6 percent of the patients showed an IOP spike. Even in Ozodex patients, the IOP spike was comparable to those of the IVTA patients. I would like to take you to a slightly more busier slide than this. This, is, this table shows multiple studies evaluating IOP spike post IVT. And as we discussed in the last slide as well, all of these patients show about IOP spike between 25 to 50% of the patients show IOP spike. But I would like to draw your attention to the column next to it that the patients who did not respond to medical therapy, they form a very meager one to 6%, that's it. So it's about 95% of the patients will not require glaucoma filtration surgeries or any surgical interventions and can be managed on just anti-glaucoma medications. But one may argue that what about the cost of long-time anti-glaucoma drugs or the quality of life that may get affected because of this anti-glaucoma drugs? So when we look into it, the duration of ocular hypertension is just about one to nine months, following which the IOP comes back to normal. The maximum IOP rise happens between two to 12 weeks. Even this anti-glaucoma medications can be completely discontinued by about eight months. There was not much difference whether you give 2 mg or 4 mg steroids, but yes, the duration of anti-glaucoma medications become a little longer with 4 mg group. So during, my literature study, so during my literature review, I realized that fear is nothing but incomplete knowledge. We do not need to be afraid to use IVT in uveitic patients. As in my opinion, the benefits far outweigh the side effects that happen with IVT. I would sum up with this last slide. Systemic steroids is effective, no doubt. But IVTA is better in almost all comparable parameters as compared to systemic steroids. On top of that, Systemic steroids act like a weapon of mass destruction, while intravitreal steroids are more precise. And with the addition of this, they become extremely safe too. Thank you. Wonderful talk, Dr. Ketan. Let's hear from Dr. Tenerson too. Thank ma'am. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. My slides are visible? Yes, then Yes. Um, thank you, Dr. Chitra ma'am and ARC for giving me this wonderful opportunity to present in this platform. So I'll be debating against intravitreal steroids along with cataract surgery. Uh, I think my opponent took the topic differently. Uh, so it is whether giving intravitreal steroids along with cataract surgery or without intravitreal steroids. So it's not about giving periocular intravitreal steroids. So cataract forms around just one minute. You have to go to so, slide show, no? It's not going? Uh, it's not going, just one minute. It's going. No, it's not. Would you try stop sharing and share again? Just one minute, no? Mm -hmm. Now it's visible? Yes, yes. So cataract forms around 40% of visual loss in cases of eviatus. Uh, and the visual outcome depends upon the type of eviatus. So it's not the visual outcome. Uh, it differs for anterior, intermediate, and posterior eviatus. The management of cataract surgery has to be individualized depending upon the type of eviatus. So the indications of cataract surgery would be one, phacoantigenic eviatus, two, in a case of quiescent eye, it's a visually significant cataract, or three, in cases of posterior eviatus, if the cataract hampers fundus assessment, and fourth, in cases of combined phacovitrectomy, if cataract is causing media haze. So when do we do cataract surgery? So we should need at least two or three months of quiescence period before taking the patient for cataract surgery. So it puts good visual outcome and it reduces the post-operative inflammation and other complications. 
The standard preoperative inflammatory prophylaxis of oral steroids works very well and it should be given one week prior to the surgery. Following cataract surgery, it should be tapered for a period of one month. And in cases of eviatic macular edema, if it is pre-existing, it has to be treated with the preoperative intravitreal steroids rather than combining intravitreal steroids along with cataract surgery. The MUST trial has studied the prophylaxis of intravitreal steroids versus systemic steroids in preventing eviatic macular edema, and there was no any statistical significant difference between these two groups. So if you look at this tabular column, this is the global variation and pattern changes in epidemiology of UVATIS uh, published by uh, Dr. Ratna Metal in 2007. And the idiopathy causes almost 44.6%, out of which anterior idi idiopathic UVATIS almost 25.6%. So most of these cases, if you control the preoperative inflammation, you may not require intravitreal steroids during cataract surgery. And infectious causes around 30.5% of cases so most of these cases might require antibacterial or antiviral prophylaxis rather than intravitreal steroids along with cataract surgery. Only non-infectious uh, group com compromises 24.9%. We'll be discussing about that. So coming to glaucoma, so around 20 to 40% of VATIS patients develop glaucoma. Either it is open angle or closed angle. Open angle could be due to the inflammation which causes damage to the trabecular measure, or it is due to steroid responder because of the long-term use of steroids, or it could be due to closed angle because of pupillary block or peripheral anterior strength, or in cases of ciliary body rotation in VKH. So definitely giving intravitreal steroids will be, it should be cautious and it should be avoided rather than, we can consider systemic immunomodulation rather than giving intravitreal steroids. So the safety profile, of dexamethasone implant has been studied in this meat group. So if you look at this tabular column, the increased IOP is the second most adverse effect. And if you look at this tabular column, so in any form of systemic steroids, even in any form of disease, if you have been given, the IOP rise is different. Uh, definitely it is a concern and it has to be considered. So in cases of non-infectious uh, posterior evatus, whether it is isolated or if it is associated with a systemic autoimmune disease like SLE, systemic vasculitis, besets, sarcoids, or multiple sclerosis, definitely intravitreal steroids alone is not going to work. If you have to control the inflammation, you have to control the inflammation of eye as well as systemic disease. Only then you can prevent the recurrence. So for which definitely you need a systemic immunomodulatory therapy, either in the form of steroids or immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, as we all know that systemic steroids long term will cause a uh, lot of adverse effects. So we have immunosuppressive therapy. We have a different groups of uh, immunosuppressive therapy ranging from anti-metabolites, alkylating agents, and T-cell inhibitors. Commonly, we use azathioprine, methotrexate, mycophenolate, and cyclosporine. So we can mo uh, monitor the side effect of these drugs regularly at regular intervals by doing all the blood necessary blood investigations. So these are safer group of drugs. By combining this immunomodulatory group of therapy, we can control the inflammation of systemic as well as ocular, and we can prevent recurrence. So we can consider another uh, alternative technology called supracoroidal injection, where it delivers targeted delivery to the respective structures. In PEACH trial, they have studied that there is a low incidence of IOP rise, and these drugs stay for at least for a period of three months. So another concern is economic burden. So in this study published in British Journal of uh, Ophthalmology, you can see that uh, the group which have eviatic macular edema and those group which does not have eviatic macular edema, the cost burden is definitely statistically significant. And in the another study, the economic burden has been reviewed in non-infectious eviatis of posterior segment, where the cumulative cost of systemic therapy over three years for a patient with unilateral and bilateral is definitely less than those the patient who received implant therapy. So another considering factor is uh, complications of intravitreal injections. As we all know that osudas can migrate into an anterior chamber, especially in cases of complicated cataract surgery when they develop PCR. And the patient can again have IOP rise. IVT again can migrate into an anterior chamber, can cause sterile endophthalmitis. In case of PCR, it can cause again endophthalmitis. And uh, so we should optimize the patient of a cataract in cases of complicated cataract in uveitis. 
So we should have a proper pre-operative optimization, intraoperative considerations, and post-operative management. So when is the best time for intravitreal? If at all, if we prefer intravitreal steroids, whether to give pre-operative, post-operative, or intraoperative. So definitely pre-operative, there is a pre-existing macular edema. It has to be treated, and then the patient has to be taken for cataract surgery. And for post-operatively, if the patient is developing macular edema, definitely it has to be considered post-operatively rather than giving intraoperative intraocular steroids. So to conclude, so definitely intravitreal steroids along with cataract surgery cannot be considered in the following conditions like infectious eviatus, those patients who are at uh, glaucoma and those who develop PCR intraoperatively and those who are having pre-existing exudative retinal detachment and those quiescent eviatus who are already on systemic immunosuppression therapy need not require intraoperative intraocular steroids. Thank you. Thank you, Tenerson, and uh, thanks a lot, uh, Ketan. Both your talks were very good. So I'll take one question and then leave the quote to Srinivas. So I'm going to ask this question to Dr. Avinash. Uh, uh, what would be, if you are uh, decided to give an intraocular, uh, I mean, along with the IUL surgery of steroids, would you prefer giving tricot or would you prefer giving osodex? And would you believe in giving before or during or a few weeks after the surgery? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. So there is no one answer for it, but uh, the indications of uh, whether to use triamcinolone or uh, dexamethasone implant would primarily rely on socioeconomic considerations in my practice. So uh, if that be the case, uh, I would prefer dexamethasone implant over triamcinolone for two reasons. Uh, number one is it doesn't cost, cost so much of vitreous opacities as sometimes it can, triamcinolone can cause. So that's one of the major reasons. And uh, for some reason, uh, the, the intraocular pressure rise has not been as uh, steep as sometimes it can happen in triamcinolone, especially when there is an anterior injection of triamcinolone, which can happen uh, in practice. And with few individuals, and uh, that those are two reasons why I prefer dexamethasone. And uh, the second question was whether preoperative, per operative injection of uh, co administration of uh, deposteroid. So, if the intraocular inflammation has to be under control preoperatively, and then only when we take up for surgery, but in circumstances where intraocular inflammation has been controlled adequately, so we prefer to go in and inject uh, deposteroids during surgery. So if it's not, if it's not controlled preoperatively, we try to control the inflammation preoperatively if there is a dire need to do uh, cataract surgery. So, and during the surgery, uh, we again uh, prefer methylprednisolone before the surgery. And at the end of the surgery, if the inflammation is still overwhelming, uh, I would suggest the cataract surgeons to go ahead with the deposteroid into the eye. And even sometimes, uh, Top it up with uh, intracameral dexamethasone as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Can I, can I make a point, Dr. Yeah, Chitra? Yes, Dr. yes, madam. Yes. See, um, my experience with the IV intravitreal triamcinolone in India is that these drugs are not very safe, not standardized, they are not uh, refrigerated. And so the risk of contamination, contaminated drugs, and infection is very high apart from inflammation. So uh, I would say that they are even unsafe, actually. And I have given up since 2018, having burnt my hands with these. So I, so I would say even safe, keeping safety in mind, uh, uh, a dex implant would be much better than trying. Uh, trying uh, but but in, uh, in Aravind, we uh, have preservative-free steroid um, disposed in small uh, amounts in a laminar coat. According to the procedure, you can buy that. It is very, very safe yeah. and very less uh, expensive. Yeah, that is a different story. But what everybody has access to is um, not that. Everybody has access to different kinds of triamcinolone acetonides, which are not standardized and not even, I think, the sterility um, they keep in mind is not for intraocular use even, because that's used for intraarticular injections, intravertebral injections. So that is the kind of things they are used for. And here it is. No, I think, uh, Dr. Goyal, you have a parallel experience of uh, people who have to procure from which company they procure. I think those depart, those discussions uh, can happen. 
But uh, over a period of time, when we see that uh, in in product what has been procured and for over 15, 20 years, it has not caused a major dent in day-to-day uh, -day practice. And that's what even you are implying. If it has caused problem to you, then you might change your practice. But uh, for rest, I guess uh, it has not caused any major change in terms of contamination. So I think we can still go ahead and, and prefer to use because there are or not all can afford an OZX implant in the eye. Only in vitrectomized eye, uh, OZX is better. Yes, Balu sir. Bala sir. Uh, sir, I have a small additional point to make. Uh, uh, in my practice, uh, the definite indication to give uh, intraocular steroids in cases where there is pre-cystigreal posterior sinicae, uh, though uh, those cases have a higher tendency to develop severe post-op inflammation, especially in non-infectious scenarios. In the uh, Indian scenario, a lot of infectious CVATs are common. We have to be very selective in uh, choosing a non-infectious CVATs. And uh, where we anticipate severe post-op inflammation, where 360 posterior sinicae, we mandately do a, a peripheral hydrotomy as well as uh, supplement with periocular steroids. I think uh, Bala sir asked my uh, question, he answered it. Uh, when the patient, of course, in the non-infectious uveitis setup, he has a posterior sinicae 360 degree. He has a PS, uh, PSC with a complicated cataract. And I plan him for the surgery. Now, if he is not a diabetic, does it make sense to start him with preoperative oral steroids at least few days before and then take him up for the surgery and slowly taper him out? So if it makes sense, then well. Then second point is what if he's a diabetic? So again, you have to ask for the treating physician to alter his dose of insulin or you give a pre-op dex, if it, but, but most of the times these patients are not affordable. Then what is the thing? Uh, how, how can we handle it? Should we go in for the IVTA or or just ask the physician that oral steroid works better in these cases and very of your steroid or posterior use. septinal steroid. You should give posterior, posterior septinal steroid. A uh, few days before. Few yeah. three days before. Yeah. And uh, my last question uh, uh, is in in case of uh, one one we did not discuss is about the intramural toxicity, uh, which is also very coming up very high. Is there any recent uh, change in the the treatment regime? Yeah, of yeah. ATP. Yeah, changed it. And, and have we seen that the, the ethanol toxicity levels have gone up? And how frequently we have to monitor because we see most of the cases on ATT and how early we have to pick up? What are the early signs that we need to know about this ethanol toxicity? Yes, so Ratina, madam. It has become a big yeah. problem. Uh, actually, the government has changed the regimen. Originally, it was ethanol only for two months. Now, ethanol is given for six months in a systemic tuberculosis. When we refer the patient for free drug in government hospital, even for ocular tuberculosis, the same way they give six months ethambutal. That is the reason we see more number of ethambutal toxicity now. So what we do is, we, we don't ask the government to give in such patients where we expect ethambutal toxicity, we stick on to original protocol of two months, uh, four drugs H and two drugs, four months. Without the only for two months. And Srinivas, to answer your query about the earliest sign, if at all there is any doubt from any reason, or even without doubt, if you want to be sure, I think VP yes. is the best way. VP. Because uh, we have, I mean, uh, we can so miss. How, how frequently we can keep doing VP, madam? Um, maybe every two, three months, three months. You can do a visual field. Visual field and all are very not so sensitive. Color vision, visual field, even visual acuity can be very uh, misguiding. But VEP is a very objective test yes, and which indeed. picks up as the first. Uh, in fact, I have had patients where we could not pick up. The patient was symptomatic. Everything uh, on our examination was normal. Color vision fields. It is only on VEP there was it was subnormal. And based on that, we were able to stop the treatment. Sudarshan, so sir, your views? We actually uh, follow with uh, fields and color vision. We were actually taught as uh, as interns to check the um, bottle cover of the ATT drugs, which had like red and green and uh, different colors. So the patients when they give the, uh, the drugs in the TB center, they would be asking, they would be asked to check the cover of the bottle to see if they are cont continuously able to see the color of the bottle, and then come back to us if they find any difference in contrast. Uh, Doctor Sudarshan, I had a patient. 
uh, on ATT, she was complaining of vision drop. I I said it may be due to cataract. Vision could be improved to six by six. Color vision feels everything normal, and uh, I allowed them to continue despite their suspicions. I allowed them to continue the ATT, and after two weeks, they sent me the VEP report. Of course, I had said that you can do a VEP if you want, and they sent me the report. It was subnormal, and patient vision by that time had dropped to six twenty four. And and I logistically, had... I think uh, VP probably picks up early, but is logistically doing it two months. You actually finish off the thermal course itself in two months. Yeah, whatever. Two that... to three months, you do. No periodicity, we can discuss. But my point is that is the best single yeah, best. Probably. Mm. So actually, I was know. talking to Kalpana the other day, and like we and some other uh, uh, AT pulmonologist here. So they were telling that it is not that if you are so worried about it, they can probably alternate substitute another quinolone or anything. Levofloxacin. So levofloxacin Anoxic is one drug Anoxic. which they use it. Uh, so initially, thermitol came into play after the streptomycin uh, was removed because of the dots uh, therapy. So now that like now our pulmonologists actually, when we are in doubt, they replace uh, thermitol with levofloxacin, especially when you have a disc edema with the uh, or uh, uh, macular choroiditis, a disc involvement. So we already have a compromised disc, then you would probably not use a drug which will again compromise it more. So you can probably substitute with levofloxacin. Okay. I mean, sector, the physicians agree and they give the prescription, but in government sector is very difficult. Recently, yeah. we have done the survey and we are working on that to statistical analysis and uh, try to publish it and convince the government to change the policy based on the toxicity report from the experts. So we are working on the manuscript now. I've got a VIP patient of sarpigenous choroiditis got healed and ethambital toxicity lost vision. Yeah, I have had patients of uveitis where I advised anti-TB therapy for the uveitis and they started losing vision from the ethambutol. Then we had to rush and change the ATT. Shall I conclude? And in yes. those one minute, in those situations, it's difficult to understand whether the vision loss is happening from your vitreitis, uveitis, or it is happening from the ethambutol. So you have to take a call on that as well. Yes, there will be disproportionate vision loss compared yeah. to the lesions yeah. in the thing. And yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So I think I'll come with my concluding remarks. So it goes without saying that we had a dream team for uh, expert panel and just amazing set of speakers, one debate after the other. And imagine I sat through it and heard every bit of it. I can even relate most of your talks. So that was the kind of energy which came through. And I'm so happy that ARC saw another very successful webinar. Thanks to the great set of speakers. And I think I should, uh, in all honesty, uh, uh, give a very special word of thanks to Dr. Avinash because he only gave me this set of topics and this name of speakers. So some of the credit is gone away from me now, but to him, because he really richly deserves it for such a wonderful evening, which we all had. And I'm sure all our attendees would have felt the same. And of course, thanks a lot to my great co-moderator who always keeps the fire going in the webinar. And uh, so thanks a lot, uh, Srinivas. And I need to thank all my ARC panel who are always there in the background, always a great source of encouragement for me. Our thanks are due to the AOS uh, team uh, led by Mr. Kripal, who is very supportive, to Sai and Manjula from Numerotech. You have your inboxes. I hope you all have not unsubscribed me that you must be uh, getting mails from us. So that tells you how each of them are supportive. Our thanks are due to our webinar admin, Dr. Anand Sethi and Mr. Sharik. You can see how he closely follows up on the duration of the talk and all the mails which come to you with the links. And most, most importantly, our thanks are due to our sponsor and our PG update series nowadays are sponsored by Sun Pharma and uh, they are truly encouraging and probably if it goes physical, we'll have those uh, two-day physical meetings too, which Sun Pharma has promised us. So we look forward to greater and greater innings with all of you, uh, great speakers. And finally, I think if you are doing well in these webinars, it's because of the kind of attendance which we've consistently got. And we look forward to it more and more, even if the physical meetings are there. Do I get a thumbs up sign that we continue webinars even after the physical meetings open up? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure. yeah. Thank you so much. Hey, Thanks a lot you. for this wonderful. I mean, you did not get my response. You didn't see me earlier. <laughs> no, <laughs> what was your response? His would be Sorry. entirely alien to what I want. What does he want? <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.
He thank, wants us to travel Chitra. all over the country. Thank you, Chitra. No, no, no. no. It's not about traveling, but I think uh, the Alzheimer's would set in very early if we are more and more into this physical. That's also the research is showing now. We are more and more into webinars, and probably the Alzheimer's also sets in more early. So I think we should sure. open up, and we'll have a more physical one, along with the webinars. Also. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, bye, Chitra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you